They come from the bowels of hell. It's the Dana Gould Hour. Jungle worms and swamp rats run around your feet. A lot of dogs that kill the calf that ate the canary. What is truth? And once again, welcome back. Hello, and welcome back to the Dana Gould Hour podcast. This is our annual holiday spectacular with great guests, true tales from Weirdsville, and of course, hours and hours of Christmas songs and holiday fun. Cliff Nesteroff is here. Cliff is a fantastic writer who has been here before, discussing his books, The Comedians, and We Had a Little Real Estate Problem. He is with us now to talk about his excellent, and in my opinion, mandatory reading, new book, Outrageous, A History of Showbiz and the Culture Wars. It's one of my top books of the year. It's a terrific read, so informative, so entertaining. I'm really excited for you to hear about it. Cliff Nesteroff. Also, actor Stephen Weber is here. You know Stephen from Wings, the TV miniseries The Shining, Chicago Med, and so much more. In addition to being a fine actor, Stephen is a hilarious guy, a monster kid, and a terrific storyteller. So happy to have finally nabbed him to be on. Stephen Weber. True Tales from Weirdsville takes the idea of no good deed going unpunished to a whole new level. It is the making of Monty Python's Life of Brian. As for me, well, I do have some things to plug. Thank you very much. I will be outside of Chicago in Batavia, Illinois at the Comedy Vault December 14th, 15th, and 16th. That's the Comedy Vault in Batavia, Illinois December 14th, 15th, and 16th. On January 11th, if you have a TV, Ted will be premiering on Peacock. Created by Seth MacFarlane, specifically for Peacock, Ted is the third installment in the Ted franchise, telling the story of Ted the Teddy Bear and John Bennett. This is a prequel to the movies Ted and Ted 2, showing John and Ted in high school. I was one of the writers on the show, and I could not recommend it more. It's really, really funny. It's really, really silly. Ted on Peacock, beginning January 11th, 2024. Are you a fan of Hanging with Dr. Z? Well, if so, I've got good news. On January 20th, 2024, here in Los Angeles, California, at Dynasty Typewriter, it's an evening with Dr. Z, live, starring Dr. Z, Rusty, comedians Patton Oswald and Aparna Nancherla, and more. January 20th, Dynasty Typewriter, here in Los Angeles, Dr. Z, live. And on January 22nd, Season 3 of Hanging with Dr. Z premieres on YouTube with special guest Kevin Pollack. January 20th, live at Dynasty Typewriter. January 22nd on YouTube. For ticket links and further details, please visit danagould.com. And lastly, if you like the show, please consider being a Dana Gould Hour Sky Cadet. Go to danagould.com and sign up for our Patreon. Five bucks a month gets you some extra audio content, some extra video content, and some junk. We don't have graduated levels. For 20 bucks a month, I'm not going to come to your house and shave your uncle's back. Five bucks a month. You get some stuff. Don't be a shy cadet. Be a sky cadet. It's a simple deal for complicated times. And now, it's on. To our filthy business. Tune in and to gas. It's the Dana Gould Hour
It's a sun dappled day high atop the Mulholland Drive view shelf here in sunny Southern California. I am sitting here with one of my good personal friends who writes real books, chapter books. Uh, he's been a guest here before. He's the author of uh, the required reading, The Comedians. Uh, also, we had a little real estate problem. Mm-hmm. Is the name of it. And his new book, I think, may be the high achievement arc. It is so timely and so perfect and such a a great fun easy read packed with so much jaw-dropping information it's really true um i i ripped through this book uh the book is called outrageous and it is a history of showbiz and the culture wars and the author is my friend and yours cliff nesteroff hello Everyone thinks that the culture wars, because of the way they're urgently mm-hmm. discussed in, in popular media, that it's this new thing. It's been around for the past five years. Right. And it certainly does have chapters. Right now, I would say the 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 most the culture war that's right in my face is in comedy. Yeah. You know, the sort of the comedians that moved to Austin in a fury. How do you describe what the what the culture wars are well generally it's a political strategy in my mind and it's essentially us versus them we're yeah. good they're evil yeah. and vagaries are very important to the culture war they can be anything that you dislike you right. know so they're doing this they're trying to take your jokes away they don't want you to say this anymore they can't they, they they're protesting yeah. this they're against free speech who who what's his name what's her name what's right. their name you don't, you know, it's whoever. Anything happening in Florida is a great example. Like right now in Florida, any teacher can go, hey, I don't like Lord of the Flies. Yeah. It has, bo- it implies boy sex, yeah, which it, it doesn't. It, but that would be enough for them to pull Lord of the Flies from the school. Right. Curriculum. It's critical race theory. Right. Well, and what that, is? Right. And that would be enough for them to pull the book from the curriculum and it's based on they are ruining yeah. our children culture the culture wars require a boogeyman and right. so there's always a boogeyman and the culture wars are similar to foreign wars in a sense american foreign policy traditionally there's always a, another dictator that's coming to get us and so we have to uh, uh scare the people enough that they'll support you know a foreign adventure some sort of foreign invasion a war right and so domestically the culture war sort of does that these people are coming to get you they're coming to get your guns they're coming to get your jokes they're going right. to take your jokes away they're going to take your guns or whatever it is and so and that it, motivates people to vote and keep you in power demonize the political adversary and support the person that if you were just voting based on reality you would never normally support you right. know nobody's going to say yes i want to pay more for health care well this is the thing that's so great about your book and it's laid out so simply because on the surface it sounds like a conspiracy i know that person's nuts because Mm -hmm. it's but there was a book that i'm sure you're familiar with a couple years ago called what's the matter with kansas Mm -hmm. and the premise of it was it's probably gosh it's probably about 20 years old now Mm -hmm. these people in kansas that are middle class people working class people they always vote against their economic interests right because they vote on culture war issues right and then the people gain power And they never solve the culture war because that's not the point. The point is, get us in power so we can then give ourselves bigger tax breaks. It's all about big business. Mm -hmm. Well, in the late 70s, and I talk in the book about this guy, Paul Weyrich, who was like an evil genius. And he's the guy who decided, you know, there's a lot of Catholics who are Democrats because they're Catholic, they're opposed to abortion. If we could make abortion a political issue, which up to that point, it really wasn't. All of these culture wars are fomented by six or seven very wealthy people. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's the Scaife Foundation. There's the Charles Koch Foundation. There's and the Paul DeVos Weyrich, family. Weyrich, yeah. This guy, Paul Weyrich, Weyrich um, had been a John Birch Society lecturer in the 60s. And the John Birch Society was always something that everybody ridiculed in the 60s, even though it had a little bit of traction. It was a far-right organization that accused President Eisenhower of being a communist stooge. They said the Beatles had been sent over here by the Soviet Union to destabilize American youth. Uh, One of their associates wrote a hilarious camp classic 
unintentionally funny called Communism, Hypnotism, and the and, Beatles. And the Beatles. Which has this hilarious Which looking Which is on cover. eBay, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> it has a hilarious cover, a drawing of the four Beatles and a hammer and sickle, and it's yeah. a must-read if you like yeah. uh, uh, stupid bullshit. But, but what's interesting is yeah. it's all the same stupid bullshit that they're doing now. Yeah, they, they're they doing it. Well, today, Charlie Kirk attacked Taylor Swift. You yeah, know, it's t- the same today, type. Of, it's it, exactly the same yeah. type of thing. And so this morning, Paul Paul Weirich was a lecturer for the John Birch Society. But those yeah, of us and the who John are, Birch Society was, in addition to being incredibly far right wing, yeah. it was unabashedly racist. Yeah, it was yeah. very much opposed to the civil rights movement. The reason I know about the John Birch Society is because of Mad Magazine. I was just going to say that same thing. That's how I know about yeah. it. It was always in Mad Magazine. And George Carlin made fun of it early on. Yeah. Bob Dylan wrote a song making fun of them. Johnny Carson would make fun of them in his opening monologues in the 60s. So, Do all you remember the- this from Mad Magazine? What's that? I think it was John Birch size of bomb Hanoi, bomb Hanoi <laughs> with our troops that are too tough to destroy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably Frank Jacobs who was known for doing those like uh, lyrical things that were like very well composed, actually. Yeah. The John Birch Society was a, a, a ridiculous thing. I mean, when I mention that communism, hypnotism, and the Beatles, it's ripe for ridicule. And today people take the culture wars very seriously. And I find that sometimes it's not ridiculed enough especially since comedy has been drafted into the cultural yeah, recent history yeah that is the new element but and, and to go back to the John Birch society the people from the John Birch society many of them were in the Ku Klux Klan uh mm-hmm. there was a lot of bleed over well there was a guy so the founding members of the John Birch society they're so interesting to look at and, and research there's a guy named uh, uh Ravillo P Oliver he was a Holocaust denier, very anti-Semitic. You can read transcriptions of his speech speeches in which he refers to Jews as parasites and vermin and whatnot. Mm-hmm. He was one of the uh, 10 or 11 people that was there, the, the first meeting of the John Birch Society. Ravillo P. Oliver's name is the same forwards and backwards. Ravillo P. Oliver, oh Ravillo P. Oliver. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's just a lunatic. Um but the other founding members included the president of the John Birch Society, Robert Welch. He was the man responsible for Junior Mints. He was a candy confectioner who uh, Crazy. was president of the National Association of Manufacturers, which was a lobby group for big business. Um, and one of the other co-founders was a guy named Fred C. Coke. I always say cock, right. but Fred C. Coke, <laughs> the father of the infamous Coke brothers. Right. And very early on, Charles Coke, who is still alive and probably the biggest mover and shaker in uh, uh, politics today in America, uh, he ran a John Birch Society bookstore in Wichita right. in 1965. And he did that for three years until his father died and he inherited all of his wealth and took over the oil company, which is uh, Coke Industries today. Here is the irony that the Charles Koch Foundation and several of these other foundations started in the day of the John Birch Society. The Bradley Foundation is a huge bankroller of political causes today. They started out buying advertising in the John Birch Society newsletters. Uh And the Bradley Foundation and the Charles Koch Foundation, um, they also fund organizations that claim to be protecting free speech, Right. several of them. At the same time, they fund something called ALEC, the American Legislative Executive Council, which ghostwrites legislation for legislators to then rubber stamp that criminalize protest of Coke Industries infrastructure. So on one hand, they're saying that they're in favor of free speech. They're protecting free speech on campus. They're the ones who really fuel this controversy that says there's a free speech crisis on campus. At the same time, they're actually paying for legislation that criminalizes free expression in the form of protest. I mean, you have to give these people credit for the brazenness of what they do and for being right in that people don't pay attention yeah, or great. care. Oh, they're, it, they're evil geniuses. Yeah, they're Lex they, Luthor. And, they're the does, brain. Yeah, for sure. It does work. Absolutely. And if, if they wanted to legalize rape, <laughs> it would be the Protect Women Act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people would just say, oh, protecting women, great, let's well, do I, it. I mentioned, this guy, well, I mentioned this guy, Paul Weirich. He's long since dead. He's been dead for 15 years. But there's still a thing that happens every week or every month in Washington called the Weirich Lunch, in which legislators meet with lobbyists and think tank 
representatives and they strategize talking points for the culture war. How do we right. demonize this end? How do we split the left or, or our adversaries? How do we consolidate power? It's called the Wyrick Lunch. Wyrick Lunch. And Paul Wyrick not only started as a John Birch Society um, lecturer, he became the founder of the Heritage Foundation in 1973, co-founded the Moral Majority with Jerry Falwell in 1979, helped uh, set up the Christian Coalition with Pat Robertson in 1989, helped fund this thing I call I mentioned called ALEC, which right. most rights legislation, another thing called the Council for National pa- Policy, which features on the board, still alive, the author of Communism, Hypnotism, and the Beatles. Right. So it's, it does sound conspiratorial, but it's very well documented. It's just that nobody cares to read about yeah. it. The Moral Majority, the Christian Coalition, the, you know, you, it sounds like there is this groundswell of people, the silent majority, right. um, written by Pat Buchanan, who's in the book, um, that are outraged at liberal permissiveness, and they're coming to, and this is a phrase that is all throughout their language that you will hear today. Mm-hmm. By, by today, I don't mean nowadays, I mean today, if you listen to the radio, we're going to Take our country back. Right, right. And all of these organizations are the stocking horses of these five or six billionaires. Yep. Quite literally, these five or six billionaires. Well, I mean, do you think that Charlie Kirk is famous because he's talented? Do you think Ben Shapiro is famous because he's witty? Or could it be that he's funded by people like the Wilkes brothers or the Koch brothers or the DeVos Foundation or the Scaife Foundation who have the financial wherewithal to keep it in your face day after right. day and, after and day after we day. We want this in the zeitgeist. We want this to be a flashpoint. We want this to be a cultural battle point. And what, and what you talk about in the book is... Thing, and this, this also thing, and this is a genre in stand-up comedy now, where the purpose is to provoke. Right. And then the audience predictably gets provoked, and then the speaker will be like, why, 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 what's your problem? Why, you can't take sure. a joke? You can't take it? It's like, the whole point of Van Coulter is to yeah. rile you up. It's well, not there's, uh, there's <laughs> to be expected, yeah. of course. There's entertainment, and then there's angertainment. Mm-hmm. And angertainment is <laughs> now, she's angry. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, they they go after these hot button issues the way a golden retriever will go after a squirrel, as <laughs> as I've evidence for you in my backyard as we speak. The uh that squirrel is her bet noir. <laughs> <laughs> that little fluffy tailed motherfucker. That'll teach it. And then uh, and then she'll talk to the dog across the street and they'll bark back and forth. Oh yeah. And I'm sure, did you see the squirrel <laughs> today? <laughs> my, fa- my my favorite joke as a child was Brian Regan. I didn't even know Brian Regan's name. I just remembered the joke my whole childhood. Brian Regan was brand new. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, my yeah. God. The translation Genius. of the dog. Yeah. Hey, 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 yeah. hey, 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 hey. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> so funny. Dude. Amazing. Especially to a 60-year-old. That was like oh, yeah. the perfect joke. The way a group like this introduced abortion as a hot-button topic. Mm-hmm. You were starting to talk about that, and I wanted to revisit that. And then we'll- Yeah. Well, Barry Goldwater, who people... Think of as this conservative demon of the 1960s. 1964, he was endorsed by the John Birch Society. Um, he was re- regarded as far right. He was, um, you know, he he was trounced in the presidential election. Right. He was considered a hero to reactionaries. Ronald Reagan came into his politically political own by endorsing Barry Goldwater at the Republican National Convention in 64. But Barry Goldwater, by modern standards, would be considered very moderate. Yeah, he said that. The moral majority scared the shit out of him, that a preacher should not be in the halls of Congress, and that abortion should be between a woman and her doctor and have nothing to do with politics, politicians, or the Republican Party. Right. And he kind of sounded the alarm about Paul Weyrich to a certain extent. He did not like these organizations, these shadow groups. Um so it was Paul Weyrich who really devised if we could make abortion a political issue, we could divide Democrats, many of whom are Catholic, and split their side and consolidate political power for the right. And it was it was a cold blooded 
strategy. Very smart. You know, mm -hmm. I cannot say that these people were involved in these think tanks and the Heritage Foundation and their long term strategies were not uh, brilliant. They were. They worked. Yeah. They were very, very intelligent, but they used their intelligence for great harm and evil. Yeah. The repeal of all civil rights laws has been one of their objectives from the very beginning. Many of the older people who are now passed away that were involved in these organizations were opposed to the original civil rights movement at the time. And once the Civil Rights Act uh, was passed in 64 and the Voting Rights Act in 65, they warned that this was going to be the road to tyranny. It's just uh, a few steps away from communist control, a grip the nation. Ever since then, they have fought against uh, affirmative action policies, civil rights laws, and looked to repeal it and have been succeeding in doing that. One of the biggest opponents of affirmative action and civil rights laws, one of the first people to write a book about how we have to repeal all of those civil rights laws, this guy... Uh, uh, Terry Eastland. He's the nephew of one of the most racist politicians in American history, James O. Eastland, who used the N-word on the floor of Congress, who uh, advocated that black soldiers returning from World War II be stripped of their medals. He said they were a disgrace to the uniform, mm -hmm. that they were raping white women overseas, mm -hmm. all these horrific things. His nephew, one of the biggest advocates for the repeal of civil rights laws. Paul Weyrich was as well. So a lot of the strategy and philosophy literally goes back to 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. Yeah. That's when the idea of a voucher, school choice, parents' rights, that argument was first tabled as a way to get uh, away from the idea of integrated schools and Brown versus Board of Education. It didn't gain traction at the time. In the 50s and 60s, that was considered an extremist point of view. And again, using euphemisms like parents' rights or school yeah, choice. Yeah, they learned how to package it. They yeah. just learned how to sell it. One of the things that you hear a lot nowadays, and this is really, I think, the heart and soul of the of the book, is the communities say, like, you can't joke about anything nowadays. Right. You can't, you can't, you can't make any jokes about anything. And, and you have quotes in here where Groucho Marx is saying that. Right. Yeah, Groucho Marx, Danny Thomas, uh, Jimmy Durante, like everybody especially in the 50s, as the civil rights movement started to heat up, there were objections to black stereotypes um, across the board, those that were remaining. Blackface was sort of taboo after World War II, but there were still um, various types of stereotypes still in play. Uh, and Danny Thomas, who did, who later produced The Dick Van Dyke Show, had his own long-running sitcom, The Danny Thomas Show, he did dialect in his acts. So he yeah. did Italian dialect, Polish dialect, black dialect, which was sort of like an Amos and Andy uh, mm -hmm. shtick. And people were complaining. And Danny Thomas was saying, uh, I'm sick and tired of these oversensitive groups, you know, to, to, to circumvent it. I'm going to do more of what they don't want me to do right. to show you that you can't boss me around. You know, people literally were saying in the 50s, you can't joke about anything anymore. And this is leading to the death of comedy. The fact that you can't do racial stereotypes or what were perceived as racial and ethnic stereotypes. Um, at the same time, there was the flip side. Rod Serling would write a script that was anti-racist right. and would be censored by the sponsors. The town has turned to dust. Yeah, yeah. You, you can't do this. you got to change Emmett Till to a white guy. we got to change the location from the south to the north. You know, right. And, and th that's actually why he came up with the, tonight, the Twilight Zone, mm -hmm. because he was tired of advertisers and censors ripping his scripts apart, specifically A Town Has Turned to Dust, which was initially about Emmett Till and turned out to be about nothing. Yeah, so in that era, in the 50s, you had people that were trying to uh, censor racism or that which they perceived to be bigoted. You also had people trying to censor, censor anti-racism. That's happening today. You see people want to suppress what they consider bigotry or bigoted stereotypes, and you see people trying to censor what is a black history or history about yeah, bigotry. critical race theory. Yeah. So these things happen concurrently all throughout history. You often hear this talking point that, well, it used to be the right that was the censor. Now it's the left. No, it's always both at the same time, but for two different reasons. Right. Generally, people on the left want to suppress that which they consider racist, bigoted, sexist. Um, people on the right, the opposite, sometimes for a variety of different reasons. It could be because you're exposing uh, the behavior of a corporation. could be that you are opposed to uh, a war of some kind, or maybe you're considered uh, defamatory of a religion, you know. But both occur at both points in history all the time. 
And people don't want to call it censorship. Because for me, the suppression of bigotry sounds logical. Right. But is it censorship? Yes, it is. I look at these uh, comedians that move to Austin mm-hmm. out of, in, uh, in uh, uh, outrage of, I don't know if it was mask mandates or... Uh, just the, the what they perceived as the political correctness of... Yeah, I think uh, a combination of both. And yeah. there's, in recent history, a lot of propaganda against Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, the yeah. great American cities. Yeah. There's like, ah, Democrat controlled yeah. the crime, the crime. Yeah. And it's, uh, again, that's part of the culture war as well. We're going to demonize those areas. Yeah, and then the, and, will you go to Austin now and you can work at Cap City, which is the comedy club and then you have joe rogan's club which is called comedy mothership which is where you're expected yeah to push the envelope the thing the thing is there are new taboos there are but there are less taboos today in comedy than any other point in history for mm-hmm. most of the 20th century politics were taboo religion was taboo sexuality was taboo and certainly on television swear words were taboo and on the stage for the first half of the 20th century you could not swear without risk of getting arrested so we actually have more freedom of speech sure that doesn't mean there aren't new taboos they are but they're mostly uh uh regarding certain slurs really there's certain slurs that were common on in stand-up in the 90s by the way there were still people in the 90s i'm gonna say the slurs in the 90s, there were still people that would get upset if you said faggot, retard, maybe not as much mm-hmm. tranny as today. But those three are the main taboos. If you watch streaming, you watch a show like The Righteous Gemstones, mm-hmm. uh, a show like The Other Two, a show like um, Euphoria, there are characters that still use those words, retard, fag. The difference is, as opposed to a show like Entourage in the early 2000s, on Entourage, the protagonists, the heroes, right. would say a word like retard or fag. Right. Today, it's the bully. It's the right. villain in those shows. But you can still say them in those shows. Those are the words that are taboo. They're slurs. Well, my special in 2015 ended with a giant bit about what I said, the R word. Yep. And in that bit, <clears throat> I equate it with the N word and the C word. That is now no longer in that special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, there are new taboos. The bit is an examination of right, that. It's right, not, you're dissecting it, yeah. yeah. But I, I get it and uh, support it. <laughs> I, but, and that's the but, thing. It's but, not but, that you can't say these yeah. things. It's that you can't say them with impunity. The other thing it's is like, that... I can't say tranny. Yeah, you can, but you might have to deal with the fallout. The, the important it. distinction is that, yes, those are new taboos. That's a far cry from saying you can't say anything anymore you can't say five things yeah. right <laughs> but compared to the 20th century you know everybody knows more or less the idea of lenny bruce that he's persecuted for what right. he's saying on stage but consider this 1962 he's arrested in liberal hollywood in the parking lot of the crescendo nightclub not far from where the comedy story is today what was he arrested for? Was it for saying fuck? Was it for railing against politics and religion? No. He was arrested for saying the word schmuck. Really? Yeah. And that was a word that was in our childhood Mad Magazine it's a all the time. Word, yeah. yeah. So George Carlin and Richard Pryor were fired both coincidentally for the exact same reason in Las Vegas in 69. They both said shit on stage. Mm-hmm. Carlin was arrested in 72 at Summerfest outside of Milwaukee for mm-hmm. swearing. Richard Pryor, a lot of people don't know this story because in the culture war of comedy, you often hear, oh, you couldn't make Blazing Saddles today. You couldn't make Blazing Saddles today. So Blazing Saddles, of course, co-written by Richard Pryor. The same year, 74, that Blazing Saddles came out, while the movie was playing in theaters, Richard Pryor did stand-up in Virginia and was arrested for the language in his act. There was no uh, obscenity law really anymore that had been overturned by the courts, so they charged him with uh, disorderly conduct. But it was for the content of his stand-up act. He had to go to the police station in the morning. They had issued a warrant for his arrest because they couldn't find him after the show, and he had to pay a a $1,000 uh, penalty before they would release him. 1974, the same time that Blazing Saddles was playing in the theater, he was arrested for using the exact same language that he had written to the script of Blazing Saddles. 74. Yeah. So the idea... And was Buddy Hackett using that same language at that time? In Las Vegas, Buddy Hackett got away with a lot in the 70s. I mean, the 70s is the first era where, for the most part, you could say what you wanted on stage without threat of arrest. But 
police departments and vice departments would still try and bust people and they'd try and bust pornographers or films that were X-rated. Right. The difference was that now when it was brought to court, the charges were almost always thrown out. Right. And so the police started to really get weary of that. Right. And of course, it was unconstitutional to try and suppress it by that point. You know, Most of the obscenity laws were overturned between 64 and 73. There's actually a mistake in my book. I say 72, but 73 was an important year for the overturn of censorship laws. Um, but police were really fighting against the courts in that period, the late 60s, the early 70s. There were topless dance clubs all of a sudden in San Francisco and Las Vegas. And people really saw this as a moral failing. We have to stop this deep throat. But there were right. also really innocuous movies that were busted. And it wasn't just the filmmakers. It was the projectionists. It was the people selling tickets in the ticket booth yeah. who would get arrested. Well, that was the whole point. They just, if we can't arrest you, we'll just harass you exactly. into submission. Alan Funt, the creator of Candid Camera, mm -hmm. made a motion picture called What Do You Say to a Naked Lady? It was a feature-length version of Candid Camera, but with topless women. The projectionist of that movie, when they were screening it in the Midwest, was arrested and briefly jailed. A Candid Camera movie. It's the most innocuous right, right, thing, right. you know. So that was very, very common. And right up into the 1980s, there was a uh, very obscure comedy team called like Bowsley and Crowther. No, that's a Bowsley. film critic. <laughs> 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 I hope that's their name. Siskel and Ebert? Yeah, no. Let's see if I can find it in my index here. They're not in the index. Well, anyways, there was a comedy yeah. team in Dallas in 1980 who got arrested because they did a novelty song about farts. And right, that's in the book. That's, yeah. That's crazy. yeah, and an audience member complained, and uh, the police came and arrested them, and they, they were threatened with a year in jail. Texas was still interested in prosecuting obscenity law, which they did with two live crew in the late 80s, and they threatened Andrew Dice Clay in 1990. They right. said, if you come to do this scheduled performance in Dallas and you say something obscene, we will arrest you. That was 1990. Right. So these things are not that long ago. So to say today that you can't joke about anything anymore, you can't say anything anymore, people are oversensitive today compared to the past is just wrong. Right. Things were far more taboo in the past, despite the fact that bigotry was frequently more permissible. Even that is maybe not necessarily true. I think I told the story on your show before of Will Rogers. He was on radio in 1934 and he said the N-word. And it was a scandalous moment. NBC and CBS, uh, right at the very beginning, in late 20s, early 30s, when the networks were established in radio, had internal policies that forbade uh, racial slurs. You know, and you could not um, do anything that was going to sort of provoke the audience. Right. You know, it would, it would worry the sponsor that people wouldn't buy their products. And Will Rogers said the N word during a radio broadcast when he was introducing a song in 1934. It was called The Last Roundup. It was supposed to be like a Western cowboy song. Mm -hmm. And Will Rogers said, said something to the effect like, it might be a Western song, but it really sounds like an N word spiritual to me. But he said the word. And the switchboard lit up. People complained. They thought they misheard because Will Rogers right. was much beloved. And they're right. like, did he say that? The song ends. He goes, was I right? Doesn't it sound like an N-word spiritual? So this created Holy a big Lord. hysteria. Will Rogers, never met a man who didn't like, he never right. did like, but he used the N-word. Um, so Shell Oil, who sponsored that program, Shell Gasoline, they said, Will Rogers, you got to go back on the air next week and apologize because we're getting all kinds of letters, yeah. all kinds of complaints, and the black press and their newspapers, the, the New York Amsterdam News, the Chicago Defender, Pittsburgh Courier, they're writing about this and they're threatening a boycott of all Shell gasoline products and all our service stations. So you have to go on the air next week right. and apologize. Now, this sounds like something that would happen today when somebody sure. slips up. Corporation that they're employed by, you got to go out there, you got you to fix this. Will Rogers goes back on the air. The show was called The Shell Chateau supposedly to apologize. He goes, well, seems like a lot of you oversensitive people got offended last week, but I think you're a little bit too quick to jump on me. I meant no offense. I've been using the N-word my whole life and nobody's oh, ever no. complained. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so Shell Oil was like, what are you doing? You were supposed to apologize. That's sort of like performing with giant six foot letters that say sorry behind you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is very comparable to things that happen today. And so a... A boycott did expand, and Will Rogers' movies, he was under contract to uh, to Fox at the time, his movies were pulled from black theaters in black neighborhoods in response to this. And the black press demanded, they wrote many editorials, you can find it if you look it up on uh, newspapers.com, they wrote many editorials 
um, saying, well, if he doesn't apologize, we're going to expand our boycott to include all Fox movies. We're going to demand that all Shirley Temple movies be pulled and so on and so forth. So that was 1934. He died the following year and the story was kind of forgotten. But that's almost 100 years ago. And it's the type of story that you would hear today. Yeah, absolutely. That you, that you would hear today. And as someone much wiser than I said, you know, the thing you hear today is, I can't talk. I'm being muzzled. By the way, you can hear me talk about it. My new special muzzled. Listen to my podcast muzzled or yeah. buy my new book muzzled. Yes. You know, it, yeah. it, it's just a stance that uh, that people ad- uh, adopt. But the stance works. People don't know their history. They don't even know recent history. People forget you know, your previous benefactor, The Simpsons, was so controversial oh, when it came out. People, yeah. are, he's saying sucks. What kind of an example is this to children? You know, you many re- schools banned Bart Simpson t-shirts in, in, in elementary schools and high schools. And, and, you know, hilariously, and there is no finer example of this to point to. If you want to see what people are doing, Look what they're accusing other people of doing. Mm. And who was the person that (laughs) wagged their finger and moralized about the degeneracy of comedy and television? Bill Cosby. Yes, yes, yes. yes, Uh, Absolutely. I I believe there was a time early in its development, and I could be wrong, but I seem to recall that there was maybe for half a day, the title of The Simpsons was toyed to be called not the cosby show <laughs> right right i've heard um, that story yeah. yeah i don't know if it's true or not well the, but, the other the other thing is that cosby and originally when they first put the simpsons on i guess thursday nights up against the cosby show somebody interviewed cosby and he said i welcome the competition he was number one in the ratings at the time the simpsons had had a special they decided i think this was their first full season they move it to thursday right he goes i welcome the competition six months go by Simpsons is suddenly number one, Cosby's number two, and Cosby is saying, this is a terrible example for our children. Yeah. You know? It was bad for business. Yeah. I mean, these things happen throughout history. You mentioned the Groucho Marx. I just want to quickly yeah. read the quote because on page 68 of the book, I have examples of all these comedians from the 50s complaining that right. you can't joke about but, anything and, anymore. And the reason I want to do this is when you hear comedian A, B, C, D, or E complain about political correctness, their their argument is sweaty and as old as a sweater at the Goodwill. <laughs> yes. So Groucho said, I think this is in 50, or so this is, I think, I'll have to double check. These, these are all from the 50s. You crack a joke about lawyers, there's a letter the next day from a legal group, complained Groucho Marx. You make funny about doctors, the AMA writes in. You have an audience of 30 million and your sponsor receives eight letters saying his comedian is a jerk and he's terrified. This is what has cramped humor. Steve Allen, the host of The Tonight Show at the time, says, The few comedians who continue to function despite the trend are subject to increasingly heavy attacks from critics, audiences, rating services, and from the vaguely defined spirit of the times. Henry Morgan, who was a really uh, incisive satirist in the 1950s, says, In television, everything known to man is sacred. Absolutely nothing can be made fun of lest it offends someone. This has led to the formation of a sleazy group of cowards whose business is to guess ahead of time what joke will offend whom. They are the termites of television. So all Termites of, the- of television <laughs> is such a brilliant Great phrase. way... But I prefer sleazy group of cowards. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Morgan was great. In fact, Henry Morgan contributed to Mad Magazine in the 1950s along with Stan Freeberg and Bob and Ray and some of the other uh, satirists of the era. So in, in the 1950s, this really became a trend, this idea that you couldn't joke about anything anymore. The Saturday Evening Post in 1958 wrote an wrote a editorial called... Uh, are Americans losing their sense of humor? And that's a phrase you hear today. Are we, you know, are we lost our sense of humor? They wrote, slowly but surely the wellsprings of humor are drying up. Personal caricature is libel. Parody is illegal. The minstrel show is a thing of the past. And blackface comics like Al Jolson or Eddie Cantor would be barred from the stage. Jack Albertson, the guy who was on Chico and the Man and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, in the 1950s, Jack Albertson said, Americans are losing their sense of humor. 
Minority groups carry chips on their shoulders. Blackface comedy, a traditional American form of humor, is unfashionable now. Um, Paul Gallico, the guy who later wrote The Poseidon yeah, Adventure, yeah, right? complained. He said that he, he longed for the days when comedy was, quote, full of racial jokes, blackface comedians, Irish comedians, Jewish comedians, and Italian comedians. The Germans, the French, the Dutch, the Mexicans were merrily and mercilessly lampooned, and nobody got into a sweat about it. If you read the first half of my book, you'll learn that this is not true, that right. all of those books protested to remove stereotypes from the stage once upon a time. And by the time they became assimilated, it was no longer a big deal. But when they were new arrivals, they really objected to the idea that they were being slandered, that their manner of speech was being lampooned. And that is the origin of one of the great devices in comedy to this day, malapropisms. Right. The way that we see Borat or, you know, yeah. whoever, Ali G do malapropisms, it's always funny. Leo Gorsi, the Bowery Boys. Albert Brooks's father. Yeah, Parkia Carcass, Norm Crosby. Malapropisms are a funny convention. They always work. But they started in the days of vaudeville ridiculing the mixed-up immigrant. Right. Know? And it was right. protesting against it at the time. Um, again, that Saturday Evening Post article, which is from 1958, wrote. And again, 1958, they wrote. Dialect jokes are taboo. A political gag may brand you un-American. And racial jokes bring a deluge of enraged mail from sensitive, in quotes, minority groups. In fact, most of the material that immortalized our old school comics is strictly out of bounds today. And Arthur Godfrey, the broadcaster of the 1950s, said, Now you can't kid anyone anymore. Negro and Italian jokes are out. It's sad. Corey Ford, an author of the era, said, We're losing our sense of humor. One by one, we've herded our, all our sacred cows behind a high barbed wire fence of patriotic or social or racial sensitivity. If a comedian trespasses inside, he is promptly punished. They're seeking to censor. And what year was this? 1958. 1958. Danny Thomas, who I mentioned earlier, later produced the Andy Griffith show, produced the Dick Van Dyke show before he did that in the black and white era of the 50s, said that uh, people were now too thin skinned, these oversensitive groups and individuals. And a defiant Danny Thomas promised, from now on, I'm going to use as much dialect material as possible in my guest appearances. I'll do Yiddish, Greek, Arabic, Negro, Italian, Irish vernaculars, and to heck with the squawks. And then there was another editorial at the same time published in the Lake Charles American Press called Is American Humor Dying? Taboos have killed off most sources of American humor. Only Jews can tell jokes about Jews. Only Catholics can tell jokes about Catholics. Only Negroes can tell jokes about Negroes. It is no wonder that comedians can no longer survive. So I just wanted to read those just to demonstrate that this argument has been going on uh, forever, and it's the same argument as before, and obviously comedy did not die. No, and, and it, it, the weird thing is that the culture wars have permeated comedy and that now comedians are on both sides of the argument. Yes. You read the book, and then you finally catch up to what you remember. Mm -hmm. Like, I thought the first culture war issue was... Right, right, right. Uh, two Live Crew and Howard's and Shock Jocks. Right, Because right. that's when I became aware of them. Right. But that was just, that was chapter 52. I mean, I noticed it in the 90s because it was The Simpsons. And then once The Simpsons sort of just became mainstream, it was... Uh, Ren and Stimpy, and then once that was sort of accepted, there was Beavis and Butthead, and once that can became, then it was South Park, and I was like, oh, there's a different cartoon every three yeah, years. A different, and I, you know, I find myself in a in a. And then SpongeBob was gay, I think, in the early two thousands. Yeah, and and, homo, and Teletubbies. Yeah, and, and Teletubbies. Homosexuality is such a uh, third rail to the culture warriors. Yes. And it is interesting to look at because I used to say, <laughs> I used to say until Dobbs, um, the thing is about these culture warriors is they point to a problem. They crank up the attention to the problem and get everybody worked up into a lather, but they are in the minority and they always lose. 
And that lather is quickly forgotten. You know, and it can be gone to something else. Acorn, acorn, acorn. Remember the, that? The, fiscal I, cliff, fiscal cliff, fiscal cliff. The, the what was the the caravan? <laughs> the caravan. The yeah. caravan. Yeah. All yeah. these, all this doomsday prophecy. Never. It's it's very much based on the evangelical conceit that the end times are nigh. Right. And then the end times never happen. Well, the, yeah, and that's why that's why anti-Semitic hillbillies love Israel because yeah, it's a biblical means the the coming of Christ yeah, is returning. Jesus, that's yeah, that's like the 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 lights at the end of the tunnel that Jesus's car is approaching. But some of the things that were drafted into the culture war are very surprising when you examine it. There's a guy named Reverend Don Wildman who was sure. connected to those Paul Weirich groups. He railed against Alf in the 80s. He started off, really, his first big protest was against Three's Company right. because Jack Tripper was uh, pretending to be gay. By the way, it, it is so funny, as, a, as somebody who remembers Three's Company, watching it when it was just on, mm-hmm. the entire premise of that show is one guy thinks another guy is gay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the entire yeah. show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I but mean, yeah, it caused a furor. Yeah, and it, you know, and it was just completely innocuous. I watched it as a child, never picked up on the gay angle, never really registered with it, never understood. It didn't matter because John Ritter's doing Pratt Falls and Don Knotts is hilarious. That's all a child needs, right. you know. And if you if you want to look at how these things are still going on, I listen to a lot of podcasts that now all have ads for Key West. Mm-hmm. To come and take a vacation in Key West. And they say in the ad, LGBTQ friendly Key West. Uh, and I think it's a, whatever the tagline is, is we're open to everybody. Why is that happening? Because the governor of Florida wanted to run for president. Mm-hmm. And the first easy pick it up because it's lying on the ground in front of you, people you could victimize to gin up conservative report. Gay people, right? And one of the and f- so they went after gay people, tanked the tourism industry. Mm. Went after Disney and gay people, tanked the tourism industry in Florida, and now you're not even going to be the president. The whole thing was for naught. Yeah, and none of these are new. You might remember in the '90s, Disney was attacked. They said there were secret messages in the Lion King. You know that you could read salacious m- messages in the clouds. Uh, Disney was protested after they I bought- didn't know that one. Yeah, they, Disney was protested because they were going to extend uh, benefits to their workers. Uh, same sex same couples. Same sex couples. They were protested. They also purchased ABC television in the 90s, as you might recall. And they owned ABC when a new TV show called NYPD Blue premiered. Right. And this guy, Don Wildman, some people will remember the Don Reverend Wild- Wildman. Yeah, people might remember him because his most notorious moment was when he accused the Adventures of Mighty Mouse, a cartoon on Saturday mornings on CBS, of promoting cocaine use. But it got pulled, didn't it? It did, because of his evangelical pressure. A lot of these evangelical groups did succeed in their attempt to censor. Three's Company lost many sponsors in the late 1970s. Reverend Don Wildman and Jerry Falwell in 1985 uh, protested the Southwest Corporation, who owns 7-Eleven, because they had Playboy and Penthouse right. on their magazine stands. They said 7-Eleven was responsible for rape, and those magazines were pulled. Compare it, again, to today, the amount of vile pornography we all have access to on our computers, In which is pocket, yeah. not controversial, compared to 1985, they're pulling these magazines uh, from the shelves. It is interesting, and I don't know the numbers on this, but now that everybody you know can just... It, you have a box in your pocket that you can watch any human activity on at any given mm-hmm. moment. Have sex crimes decreased, increased, stayed the same? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know either. Um, I, I know that people are definitely into spitting, choking, and uh, fucking people in the ass probably more yeah. today. Yeah. Well, they think that that's normal. Yeah. There was uh, a movement a couple of years ago where I think they had adult women, adult, female adult stars doing these PSAs like, Women don't really like to get choked. Right. Don't choke your girlfriend. Right, right, right. right, (laughs) right, Boy, somebody needs to tell you that. I went and saw uh, Boogie Nights in 70 millimeter the other night. The Egyptian just reopened and they showed it. And I've stayed for all the credits because there's so many people in that movie before they were famous, you know. But at the very bottom of the credits, which I'd never seen before, uh, consultant, Ron Jeremy. Oh, wow. (laughs) Wow. My friends built his fake pee-pee. 
I didn't know he had a fake people. Oh, in Boogie Nights. Yeah. I think maybe Ron Jeremy's no, no, fake no, no, people. I was no. like, oh, I didn't know it was fake. No, uh, uh, Mark Wahlberg's. Anita Bryant was really one of the first people to really make homosexuality the culture war uh, issue. And she had assistance from this guy, Paul Wyrick, who right. went on to found the moral majority. And, and, her- and Anita Bryant, for people who don't know, yeah. was a famous... Singer, yeah. singer. She was just like a nice singer that you know, like Celine Dion today. Like, yeah, oh, she's a great singer. Well, she we would like appear her. on the Lawrence Welk show. Yeah. She did many Vietnam tours with Bob Hope. Very mainstream, and uh, she became the spokesman for Florida Orange Juice. And she, I will. And she was she lost her contract with Florida Orange Juice based on her anti homosexual campaign. But her arguments, if I could find some of them in the book, very similar to the arguments you hear today about these other culture war issues, drag queen story time, or or what have you. Yeah, um, Bob Goldthwait yeah. has a shirt that I want to get that says, imagine being afraid of drag queens and books. Right, right. And that is where we are. And it does, you do sometimes think, and that's why this book is so important. Like, are we sliding back? Well, I no. think, yeah, <laughs> we're where we always were. Exactly. We're in the same place. So I have this quote from Anita Bryant. She had lost her contract as the spokesperson, spokesperson for Florida Orange Juice because she was on this very aggressive anti-homosexual campaign. I remember it. Um, she was trying to make sure that no homosexuals could be school teachers in Florida schools. So it's always fucking Florida, man. Yeah. So she lost several of her showbiz gigs as a result because she was just too controversial, too aggressive uh, in the eyes of many. The only people that were really defending her were Jesse Helms, Jerry Falwell, people that were considered uh, far right. But this is a quote from Anita Bryant in the late 70s. I have been blacklisted for exercising the right of a mother to defend her children and all children against their being recruited by homosexuals. Because I dared to speak out for straight and normal America, because I dared to challenge the immoral influence of homosexual recruiters, I have had my career threatened. I have had my First Amendment freedom of speech abridged. Right. Doesn't that sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. Sound familiar? Yeah. And Bob Hope, who people think of as a right winger, he was liberal socially. Yeah. And, and he, he had a, th- there's a great story about Bob Hope in this. And it, I believe one of his yeah. adopted daughter. Gay daughter. Was yeah. gay, yeah. Yeah. Bob Hope had done all these Vietnam tours with Anita Bryant. She was one of the people that went over there with him all the time, the late 60s, early 70s. And so Bob Hope said, you know, that she was a good friend. He had known her for years. And then, quote, because of this, this is Bob Hope talking, It's very hard for me to discuss this subject. Uh, I believe Anita Bryant is going too far. I believe what these people do behind closed doors is their business. Anita has been around show business long enough that she should know about the contribution homosexuals have made. So that's Bob Hope. That's Bob Hope. Defending gay people in the face of... uh, Anita Bryant's hysterical fire and brimstone that they're coming to take your children. Yeah. They're recruiting your children, which we always hear today. What's interesting is that the right wing, you know, loved Bob Hope until he said, and then, and then he had a big faux pas in the eighties. Yeah. He, uh, at the height of the AIDS crisis on a television special made the following joke. The statue of Liberty has AIDS. I believe the actual joke was, I hear the Statue of Liberty caught that AIDS bug. <laughs> we don't know if they got it from the mouth of the Hudson or the Staten Island Ferry. Right. Jaw dropping. Had to apologize. Yes. And, and did apologize. And then, you know, did a lot of PSAs and benefits. And then the right wing turned on him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like the, they turned on him for liking gay people. Yeah, yeah, they, he wasn't the guy that they thought he they was, you know. Yeah. That, that frequently happens. I mean, they, the book ends in 2003 with people turning on the Dixie Chicks. A similar situation. Right. And what, that, that is what is amazing about this book, is that people think that we are in the high dudgeon of the culture wars now. And, and I think that we're not in any more culture war situation than we always have been. It's just that because of social media, the volume on everything is turned up Mm -hmm. to that point. I, I can't tell you how much better my life has been since I left Twitter. Mm -hmm. We hear about it more. It's louder because of social media, but there's as much of it going on now as ever. Yeah. I make an argument in the introduction to the book. It's not that things aren't terrible now. They are. 
They were always but, terrible. Yeah. When I was a kid, my dad bought the newspaper only on the weekend, Saturday or Sunday edition, and he would read the whole thing once. Yeah. He didn't keep scrolling through the newspaper, rereading the same editorial over and over, the same editorial or headline over and over. You know, today, did, we, yeah. anytime there's a lull, we're waiting in line, we're at a red light, we're scrolling, and it's being repeatedly reinforced over and over and over. Again, a lot of this stuff happened in the 80s under Reagan with the deregulation that these people wanted, and they got the political power to get it by dividing the electorate through culture wars. Mm -hmm. An example being radio station ownership. These large networks wanted to own more radio stations, but there was a rule, I believe it was put into effect after World War II, or before they didn't want radio stations to become a source of propaganda. So well, yeah. you were not allowed to own more than however many radio yeah, stations. Yeah, well, I mean, it was just sort of a derivative of the antitrust idea to, to, to prevent monopoly so that there were multiple voices, not just one voice. There was uh, two series of deregulations. So the Reagan administration got rid of what they called the fairness doctrine, which right. meant that for every controversial issue that was expressed from one political point of view, you had to allow somebody else to request equal time to present their point of view. So that there was a balance on the right. issues. The Reagan administration removed that. In terms of ownership consolidation, it was Bill Clinton's administration that removed that rule that allowed and opened it up so that one corporation could own dozens of radio stations or television stations or newspapers all in one market. Whereas previously there had been different stages of rules where you cannot own more than two radio stations within a certain geographic sphere. All right. of that is gone. So media consolidation has become more and more concentrated, concentrated, concentrated. Spokane, Washington, not far from where I grew up in Canada, was actually considered a testing ground for this. As they removed some of those rules, I remember this very distinctly. I was a child, probably 11 years old. We were at an intersection, a four-way intersection, big, busy intersection in Spokane, four separate billboards, four separate corners, all advertising the Rush Limbaugh show, four different radio stations. So that is sort of indicative of what happened with this sort of removal of these regulations that limited the amount of ownership you could have right. in one And Rush area. Limbaugh is a guy that was just a nobody DJ. Yeah, he'd who, been a disc jockey in Florida. He actually replaced, this is his claim to fame, this is how he came to prominence, he replaced Morton Downey Jr. Right. Remember the, sure. the combative talk show host? Friend he, of Joseph Kennedy. He was doing a radio show in uh, Sacramento, KFBK, in 1985, and then he said something that was considered racist. He got fired. He was replaced with Rush Limbaugh. And KFBK was one of the famous clear stations that had one of the most powerful signals in America. So you could hear KFBK in Mexico, you could hear it in Canada, and you can hear it all the way up and down the coast in the United States. And as a result, because they had such far reach, Rush Limbaugh became famous. He was heard up and down the coast. And eventually, KFBK started to syndicate the program, and it was heard around America. So by the late 80s, he was heard in more and more areas when Clinton, ironically, removed the limitations on station ownership. It paved the way for Rush Limbaugh to become a national star. Clinton did a lot of stuff that traditional liberals didn't agree with. He picked a culture war fight that was contrary to liberal orthodoxy. He went after Sister Solja. That's right. That's right. And that helped triangulate him into the mainstream. Clinton knew that, you know, Paul Sanga, like the 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 field of dead Democrats was stacked. Mm -hmm. And he picked a fight with somebody that was not a a fight that another Democratic candidate for president would ever pick. Mm -hmm. And it helped him a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the irony is he that... May, when, for people who don't know, Sister Soldier was a rapper yeah. who had a, I guess, a cop killer-like song, which was a huge problem in and of itself. And, uh, and that helped him out. Yeah, Dan Quayle and many other uh, Republicans went after Ice-T's body count for the song Cop Killer. Two Live Crew, same thing. It was uh, Colonel Oliver North joined with a guy named Jack Thompson, who was a lawyer who had um, 
tried to live crew for obscenity. He had also been disbarred. And lost. Yeah, he'd also been disbarred for uh, fraud and lying. Mm -hmm. And after that, and and this was after Iran-Contra as well, he and Oliver North got together and they wanted to prosecute Ice-T for incitement for the song Cop Killer. So... Again, it's it's sort of a repetitive culture war tactic. Ice T himself said, you know, if you if you listen to the song Cop Killer, if you listen to the song or the band Body Count, they're actually a rock and roll band. It's guitars. Yeah, it's, it's punk rock. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. not a rap song. Yeah, no. And Ice T said, every time you hear somebody mention my song Cop Killer, they call it a rap song. Why do you think that is? Because they know rap means black. And yeah. when you're speaking to that demographic about, oh, they're they're out to kill the police officers, this or that. You know, it's there's a the racial coded message there. Yeah, it's a it's what they call a dog whistle. Yeah, yeah. We were talking about the deregulation of radio stations that gave rise to the era of the shock jock. Mm -hmm. And what I find interesting about the shock jock, and and it plays into sort of the dilemma now, is let's say Carlin Pryor, Lenny Bruce, those guys. They were all about freedom of speech, that you should be able to say what you want. And at the time, they were talking about whatever drug, schmuck, whatever. And the man was coming down on them because of free speech. So you would think, yeah, I'm, I'm all for free speech. Then de uh, Reagan era deregulation, the rise of the shock jock. Mm -hmm. Now, these same companies... These right-wing companies are decrying the decay of morals because of the shock jocks, even though they're benefiting from the deregulation that they demanded. That's right. But the people on the left, I don't want to have to defend Spinner and Paddlefoot or, you know, Rick and the Demon. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's Bag of Diarrhea Day. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it puts the people, uh, the progressive mindset in a weird position because, yeah, I... I understand that, uh, you know, as someone once said, uh, the First Amendment comes at a steep price. It's Andrew Dice Clay. <laughs> so yeah. Well, know. I mean, there's, there's people who identify as free speech absolutists, but there's really no such thing. In American law, you have exceptions. Libel law, slander law, incitement law, harassment law, yeah. copyright law, plagiarism try, law. Try, try, try spray painting the word cunt on the side of your house. Right, <laughs> you know? right. Well, exactly. If you paint over that, are you against free speech? Yeah. Are you suppressing somebody's yeah. right to free expression? Guess what? If you're speaking dogmatically as a so-called free speech absolutist, yes, yeah. it is censorship. You are suppressing their free, their free expression. And yeah. everybody would agree that it would be logical to paint over that. You yeah. know, So we come up with these... Um, dogmatic phrases, free speech, no exceptions, but everybody has an exception. And you can come up with the most absurd defenses for free speech. Yeah. You know, you cannot scream fire in a crowded well, movie house. Charles Koch successfully, through Citizens United, they ruled that unlimited corporate donations are speech. Right. Well, obviously, that's absurd, but they yeah. won that case. Because they were funding the Federalist Society which was feeding conservative judges yeah. to Republican lawmakers all the way to the Supreme Court. Yeah. By the way, Ed Meese was one of the founding godfathers of the Federalist Society, one of the most pro-censorship politicians in history. He's the sure. guy who did the Pornography Commission under Reagan. He was the guy who was the top cop trying to suppress what they called the Berkeley Free Speech Movement in right. the 60s. That's how he came into Reagan's uh, sphere. The kerfluffle about Andrew Dice Clay is, 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 is comparative to this, where he used the same arguments as Lenny Bruce. You know, they're trying to silence me. They're trying to silence me. Yeah. And that appeals to guys that replace windshields for a living. Yeah, yeah. the man's coming to silence me. These are the same people that listen to Joe Rogan. These are right. the same people as in Ben Shapiro. Right. The man, quote unquote, Thinks he's smarter than you. Yeah. There's, he's there better than you. Just this week, there's a story. I won't get into the specifics because who cares? But a guy got convicted of uh, uh, fraud, voter fraud, promoting, you know, saying if you text. Right. Me, I remember that. Right. Yeah. So the, his lawyer argued that his free speech rights were being suppressed. Fraud. You're committing fraud. 
Is that free speech? So in a way, again, you can make these absurd arguments, say that this is a suppression. You could argue anything is a suppression of free expression. If I grope somebody and I'm not allowed, well, I'm just freely expressing. Right. Yeah, my, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, yeah. So these are absurd arguments. But uh, I don't want to, you know, but it's a good thing that it's frowned upon in polite society for white people to use the N word. That's a good positive thing. Yeah. If, if a white shock jock wanted to do it or someone wanted to do it, and, and that one's even such a third rail, like not even Rogan will go there. So, the, so let's, let's take the acceptable example, transgendered people. There's a, there's a school of comedians and comedic thought that is outraged that they can't use them as a punching bag. Yeah. Because unlike making fun of black people or Jewish people or Latinos, they don't have enough advocacy mm-hmm. to defend themselves. Mm-hmm. It is the level of our polite society that is their advocacy. And that's the origin of this, like, you can't say anything anymore. That's mm-hmm. the current flavor of it today. Mm-hmm. So if somebody, a comedian, wants to make a bunch of anti-trans jokes, they will cite the same arguments that Lenny Bruce cited. And I'm put in the position of, well, I liked it when Lenny Bruce did it. Mm-hmm. I don't like it when you do it. Yeah. Because, and this is the old expression, and this is actually Carlin said it about Andrew Dice Clay. Lenny Bruce was making fun of the powerful. You're making fun of the powerless. Mm -hmm. You know, you're punching down, you're punching the victim. I think one part of the argument that is often misconstrued, especially on the college campus, but anywhere, somebody says something on stage somebody in the audience, I'm not talking about hecklers, I'm just talking about in general, objects to what the person says. Protest is a form of free expression. Mm -hmm. A person speaking on stage is uh, employing free expression. The debate is usually framed as free speech versus would-be censors, but it's actually free speech versus free speech just opposing viewpoints. Right. And that is what the culture war likes to twist and manipulate. These people who are protesting, well, that's not free expression. They're trying to take something away from you. They're trying to suppress you. They're trying to censor you. And it's a way of demonizing one form of free expression that opposes bigotry or that opposes things that the other person purports. And that's, I think, a very important uh, point to make, which is, frequently glossed over, manipulated to this point where it's like, well, it used to be the left-wingers who were in favor of free speech. Now it's the right-wingers. No, it's always sort of been racist versus anti-racist or bigot versus anti-bigot or pro-gay versus anti-gay or uh, religious dogma versus anti-dogma. It's free expression versus free expression. And so many people appropriate the other people's heroes i have had so, i've seen so many yeah. gun memes quoting george carlin mm-hmm. who never said it no <laughs> never no. believe you know, every every week my sister sends me i have to no honey i shouldn't do it. he never my, said my, that. my hero uh, frank zappa as well i put it intentionally put a quote in this book he is one of the people in this book we didn't get to that yet the the two people in our popular culture that really were so perceptive yeah, clarity, yeah. of what was happening was George Carlin and Frank Zappa. Mm-hmm. And, and you spend a lot of time going through the, uh, the what was it? The, it was Tip P- of PMRC, yeah, Parents Music Resource Council, who right. wanted, they're responsible for the parental advisory sticker right. that we have on. And that, and that was, the, the, the head of that group was a Democrat, yeah. It was Tipper Gore. Tipper Gore, Al Gore's, Al Gore's wife. wife. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, Frank Zappa, a lot of people like to claim him the way people like to claim George Carlin, um, libertarians especially, because right. Frank Zappa, this often happens in American politics. If you, crimin- if you criticize Democrats and Republicans, well, a libertarian party wants to claim you. But there are people like me 
who would condemn Democrats, Republicans, and Libertarians as yeah. all being deficient. Well, the old expression was a Libertarian is just a guy that wants to be an asshole but still smoke pot. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But Frank Zappa, some people claim that he was a Libertarian. And so I have a quote in this book. It's actually an obscure quote that I yeah. found from a radio interview that he did in the 80s where he said the Libertarian Party came to him and asked if he would be a candidate for president or at least for Congress for the Libertarian Party because they saw his performance uh, when he was criticizing Tipper Gore and the PMRC. Right. Um, even though she was a Democrat, she was being fed, quote unquote, information, evangelical groups that were claiming Cindy Lauper was immoral, twisted sister, this and that. And so the Libertarian Party approached Frank Zappa with the idea of becoming a candidate. He said, well, I don't know much about your party. Why don't you send me all your, your literature and your pamphlets? And he said two of the things that disturbed him were one, that Ron Paul was one of the libertarian heroes. Rand and, Paul's father. Yes. And Frank Zappa in the book, he says something to the effect of, well, Ron Paul used to be a member of the John Birch Society. Probably still is. Probably just couldn't get elected. Stopped calling himself a Republican. Started right. calling himself a Libertarian. So that was a non-starter for Zappa. Raised an right. alarm bell. When he read their pamphlets and it was all about eliminating all regulations on corporations and big business, Zappa said, no way. Yeah. We know from experience you limit regulations they start to commit crimes. Right. So Frank Zappa was perceptive about that. He turned down the Libertarian Party. Yeah. And that's the thing. And, that, you know, that's the difference in the, the progressive mindset and the, and the conservative mindset is that, you know, conser the conservative mindset, speaking in broad terms, thinks that, well, people are immoral, but corporations aren't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And progressives think that corporations are immoral, but people aren't. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's just like, no, everybody's going to game every system. People are shit. Well, people don't want to demonize their own side or right. criticize their own side because they're afraid that that'll feed the opponents. Exactly. Uh, psychop. And, and you that's can, why you have Republicans you have to pretend supporting that, Trump. You have to pretend that Bill Clinton wasn't sexist, that he didn't yeah. commit sexual harassment, that it's all just a conspiracy. Right. Well, those people that were accusing him on, on the right were also sexist. Right. But it doesn't mean that what he did wasn't true. It doesn't make Joe Biden a great speaker. Right. You know? It doesn't make drone strikes by President Obama moral, you right. know, but nobody really wants to say that for fear that it becomes a Republican talking point. And so much of it is Red Sox and Yankees. Yeah, so exactly. It it's matter, like sports. Right? So yeah. how do you, as a guy that follows comedy, mm -hmm. uh, um, and as a comedian, as, 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 Used to be. as, as retired, as, but, uh, I, I was, it was Judd or Patton that called you the, um, Doris Kearns Goodwin. Of yeah. Apatow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so perfect. Um, uh, where do you come in on where Bill Maher finds himself today? Because Bill Maher now, yeah. who's a full disclosure, a friend of mine, <laughs> and I've done the show a lot. I like him. Yeah. Uh, um, but uh, in on like the Daily Beast, he's yeah. a bit of a punching bag. Yeah. He seems to be somebody that is trying to hew to the center and call out hypocrisies on both sides. Mm -hmm. Um with uh, varying degrees of success, where do you come down on, on Well, that? I think he is fed faulty information from wherever he gets it. You know, a lot of the experts about what's happening on a college campus are not on a college campus. Right. You know, how yeah. often is he there? He's being fed information about right. the culture war and buying into it. If you ever write a sequel to this book, Barbie, mm -hmm. like the outrage right. of the Barbie movie, which I only saw a week ago. Yeah. Well, this, this was just like, I couldn't believe yeah. anybody said anything about it. What, yeah. was the, what was the issue with that movie? Yeah, 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 yeah. I know I'm genuinely asking, what did people not like about that movie? Yeah, no, it's a crowd pleaser. I mean, you can pretty much create a controversy about anything if you... What was the controversy with it? That it um, uh, used words like patriarchy, which was considered like a critical race theory type influence. But, but yeah, critical race theory is, is the, does the critical or critical is, theory, I should say, because because the, yeah. the, the whole school doesn't just include race. It but includes, does critical theory it, does that imply I don't want to hear things that make me feel bad about myself? Well, sort of. Because that, isn't that. The Making thing is, fun of a the, safe space, which the is iron, the, the, iron, the irony is that nobody heard of critical theory or critical race theory until Fox News made it a talking point. Right. That's how we all learned about it. Right. It was a obscure form of scholarship that existed, and it was the idea that 
racism and sexism is infused into the very culture. Yeah. And so it's not the just... The 1690 Project. Yeah, so it's not just one racist person, but it's part of the entire... The phrase they use is systematic. And, and that phrase, I think, comes from critical theory, systematic right. racism. And I so. think it is. And a great example is something that you just said. Will Rogers didn't think right. he was being racist. Right. And, you know, people that people can be racist without oh, frequently, thinking yeah. they're yeah. being racist, right. you know, or sexist or anti-trans. or under, Right. And yeah. nobody likes to hear that about themselves. Right. You know, all of us, no matter who we are, no matter I've how progressive it. you I've are, if you're accused of something like that, you're immediately going to be defensive. Right. You know, there's three things in America that nobody likes to be told. They don't like to be told they're, they don't have a sense of humor. They don't like to be told that they're uh, racist. And there's something else that I can <laughs> <laughs> But no, nobody likes and to be told. They don't want to hear there's no more pie. <laughs> yeah. No, everybody's going to deny they don't have a sense of humor. Right. Phil Donahue in the 80s, he'd have Klansmen on, and the audience would be boo, boo, and the Klansmen would be in a big pointy hat yelling, I'm not racist. I'm not racist. Yeah. Like, if that guy is not racist, then who right. is, you know? Right. So nobody wants to confess that. But nobody likes to hear do, about now, themselves. Now, the, the genius of the way they think now is the, they say, well, you know, the people that, you know, uh, what a Ben Shapiro type person would say is uh, the people protesting the Klan are the real racists. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. And they what they do is they present an argument that is so outrageous, you look like an idiot taking part in it. Yeah. Yeah. You're bigoted against bigots. Yeah. Yeah. I am. But what they do is like, you know, you know, Emmett Till was the real racist. And then and then by arguing with them, you put that premise on the table. Well, that's the affirmative action argument that it's um, re- reverse racism yeah. instead of a corrective to racism. Right. Oh, you're discriminating. You're suddenly you're in favor of discrimination. Yeah. Well, Trump calls this any any black judge or right. attorney general is racist in reverse. Right, 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 right. right. Yeah. Right. Uh, it, 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 and again, it just goes back to the whole point of like, nothing, uh, nothing is any different. And, and nobody was really, you know, what it seems you're talking about, like so much of this stuff happened. Uh, so much of modern conservatism, by modern, I mean, the last 20, 30 years, uh, came in under Reagan, mm-hmm. who was a much more, saleable packaging of Barry Goldwater. Well, Ronald Reagan's political career, I mean, it starts as the president of the Actors Union in a way when he was sort of doing the bidding of the bosses who did not want to pay out residuals to old movies and reruns, and Reagan secured that for them. No residuals for anybody who appeared in something before 1963. Mm -hmm. Mentioned in the book that Mo Howard from The Three Stooges really hated Reagan because it cheated The Three Stooges out of their royalties. Yeah, let me read you a little bit. It's because everybody thinks that Reagan was... You know, now he's Jesus. Um, by the way, Reagan would be kicked out of the modern day Republican mm-hmm. Party for being a liberal swish. <laughs> but uh, yeah, here are some here are some quotes about Ronald Reagan from people who knew him. Jimmy Stewart said he's just a Johnny come lately. He'll never get anywhere. Dana Andrews said he was a buffoon. Myrna Loy uh, accused Reagan of destroying everything now I've lived my life for. Um uh, director Curtis Bernard said, I didn't know about his politics. I only thought he was stupid. <laughs> um, uh, the, and then the, the, but the best one was Rod Serling who said in 1966, when he was governor, Ronald Reagan was thought to be a company man and forever a company man. What other qualifications did Ronald Reagan have to be governor of the most populous state of the union? Well, with a magnifying glass, I still couldn't discover it. I don't know how the hell this man could run for public office. And then Mo Howard said, a few years after the TV release of our shorts, Ronald Reagan, who was then the president of the Screen Actors Guild, was instrumental in passing a SAG ruling that there would be no residuals for pictures made prior to 1960. That shut us out. And that was done at the behest of the corporations that didn't want to pay them. Yeah. So Ronald Reagan really came to prominence at that time. In 64, he spoke at um, the Republican National Convention in favor of Barry Goldwater. And his speech was so well delivered and he was so charismatic. And he was. In fact, there's a brief passage in this book. I actually defend Ronald Reagan, believe it or not. I say that his detractors often insulted him by calling him a failed actor 
or a bad actor. Right. That was it's sort of like making fun of Donald Trump for his hair yeah. instead of his policies. Yeah, that's not the problem. For me, Ronald Reagan's movies are the best thing about him. And he appeared in some fucking great movies. Yeah. Don Siegel's The Killers. There's a movie called Ju- Juke Girl, which was directed by that guy, Curtis Bernard, who thought he was stupid. Right. He made some great movies. They're right. worth watching. And frankly... And Milo I, and Ermey had lunch with him once. With him, <laughs> She had lunch with James Dean and Ronald Reagan. Wow. At the CBS Commissary because they did a live TV presentation together. Oh, that's incredible. Uh, a live, like a Playhouse 90 thing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she said uh, he wanted to have lunch with us. And then he just spent the entire lunch looking at his watch and staring at other yeah, people. Yeah, I, I, I knew a woman who dated him named Monica Lewis, a girl singer who passed away. Her brother produced the Ed Sullivan show, uh, Marlo Lewis. And she said that uh, they went on a couple dates, but he was super boring. She found yeah. him to be very dull. But anyways, I defend him. And I like guys who act in movies with chimpanzees. I like that. <laughs> but that's what everybody made fun of. But really, again, just like Donald Trump's hair, you're missing the sort of... Yeah, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. But that's what brought him to prominence. The Heritage Foundation, to bring it back to where we started, in 1973, founded by Paul Weirich, they ghost wrote a plan that was sort of based on the old John Birch Society policies, how to repeal civil rights, how to repeal uh, Voting Rights Act, you know, all these things that they considered uh, uh, contrary to their belief system. When Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, they presented him with a, uh, a, a pile called Mandate for Leadership ideas to implement while you're in power. Heritage Foundation still exists, yes. and they've just drafted a plan recently for 2024 that is sort of the new mandate for leadership. And if you read it, it's all extreme, extreme policy, the right. deregulation well, they, of everything. Yeah, they've been able to... It's so funny because on on social arguments, they tend to lose on like homosexuality, transgender rights, civil rights. You know, it's like you cite in the book several arguments that, about rap music. They tried to make, they tried to demonize it and people are just like, sorry, yeah, try again. Right. But in the big picture, corporate governments, they smoke. They smoke. Well, when you have an endless amount of money to spend, you can win. Yes. It comes right down to that, you know? Yeah. And, you know, one thing I wanted to mention before we finish up is that the famous George Carlin controversy, the seven words you can't say on television, the Pacifica radio right. case, which he famously lost. Sometimes when you hear about that story, you hear, well, a parent heard the routine on the radio and was right. driving with his kid and filed a complaint with the FCC. That parent was a lobbyist, an evangelical lobbyist named John H. Douglas. He was part of something called Morality in Media. They were um, an offshoot of another organization called AIM, Accuracy in Media. Accuracy in Media are the ones who coined the phrase liberal media bias and got it into the body politic. Morality in M- Media Crazy. Morality in Media was funded by Coors, the beer right. company, who were hostile to civil rights in the 60s. If you worked for Coors in Colorado in the 60s, when you got your paycheck, in the envelope would be John Birch Society pamphlets with your paycheck. They also are the ones... Really? And the company was run by a guy named Adolf, which is strange. <laughs> <laughs> and in 1973, they also provided the money that helped found and establish the Heritage Foundation. So the Coors funded this group, Morality and media, and this lobbyist, John H. Douglas, was the quote unquote parent who first complained that right. he was driving in his car and heard George Carlin. They had already campaigned against Playboy being stocked in, in stores. They had already campaigned against The Godfather being shown on television because of the swear words, because yeah. of the violence. And so it wasn't a random complaint about George Carlin. It was part of this conceded sure, yeah, effort. Yeah, they, they, these are cherry picked cases, they set them up. A lot of these people were former, former McCarthyites. Uh, many of them uh, had opposed Brown versus Board of Education, the civil rights movement. And Steve Allen, who had been the first host of The Tonight Show and attacked by the John Birch yeah. Society, in the late 90s, before he died, he ended up sort of being a part of this. There was a guy named Brent Bazell Jr. He had been McCarthy's ghostwriter. He ghost wrote a book called Conscience of a Conservative by Barry Goldwater. Right. Um, and he, in 73, was connected with this group, uh, Morality and Media, and they went after Norman Lear and criticized all in the family for being communistic. 
His son was a guy named Brent Bazell III. So it was Brent Bazell Jr., Brent Bazell III. Brent Bazell III. His family cannot think about another name. Yeah. (laughs) Brent Bazell III recruited Steve Allen to be the face of their campaign, which was decrying what they considered immorality in television. And there was sort of an infamous newspaper ad that was syndicated all across America in the late 90s. And it said, parents, are you tired of television sending your children down a moral sewer? Yeah, moral sewer. Right next to a photo of Steve Allen. And this was the campaign of Brent Bazell III. And they had a little coupon where you could donate money. But they were going after Hollywood. Once again, Hollywood was becoming the boogeyman in the culture war. Right. They're the ones that are responsible for the downfall of America. They're promoting homosexuality. Bada, 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 bada. So Steve Allen, who had been a very progressive voice in the 50s and 60s in favor of civil rights, opposed to the John Birch Society, by the end of his life, he too, almost in a Bill Mars type fashion, felt that we were in the middle of an American downfall. Yeah. And he pointed to things like the Farrelly brothers, the David Spade sitcom, Just Shoot Me. <laughs> Just Shoot Me. He said the show Dawson's Creek was promoting moral disorder. Yeah, no, it was crazy. It was crazy what happened to him. I mean, he really did completely flip. Well, it sometimes happens with age. And I have many examples in the book. Somebody like Mae West, who was considered the scourge of moral groups in the 1920s, and she was arrested and went to jail for 10 days for doing a play about sex. By the 70s, as the new Hollywood came in and you could swear and show nudity, she found it disgusting, dirty, and immoral, which is what people said about her back in the 1930s. Same thing happened with Billy Wilder. He was attacked by the Catholic Legion of Decency for being immoral. By the 1970s, Billy Wilder said Hollywood's turned into a whirlpool of dirt and filth. I mean, I I don't want to become that person. I'm afraid I will become that person. Right. Where I find myself like raising an eyebrow is in popular music. Mm-hmm. Like all the songs that my daughter listens to, they all have shit and fucking them. Yeah. Yeah. Which we, you know, the Beatles never sang. I want old your fucking hand. You yeah. it's like, they couldn't do it. And music was fine. And yet, just, and yet it's, not, it's not my job. To and yet it's not particularly controversial. You know, again, all. that's why I'm saying that Taylor Swift, American, you know, that's again, that's why I'm saying you can say more than you used to. Wet Ass Pussy was a hit. It wasn't particularly controversial, whereas T- Two Life Crew, for doing something very similar, were put on trial and convicted of, of, of obscenity in my lifetime. I right, was born yeah. in 1980. Yeah. So um, you can say more now, yeah. not less, even though there are some new taboos. Yeah. yeah it, it's really interesting. Did you have a Steve Allen story? Yes. I, what a great way to end this, uh, with this podcast interview. The, b- b- the book is outrageous uh, by Cliff Nesteroff, K-L-I-P-H-N-E-S-T-E-R-O-F-F, a history of show business. It's such an easy read. It's so entertaining, and it will change the way you hear and see any newscast that pertains to this stuff. You immediately, it exposes the matrix. Mm. (laughs) You say, oh, it's all... Yeah. Um. So as you know, we were talking about Steve Allen was a champion of this kind of stuff. He was the first host of The Tonight Show. He put Jack Kerouac on The Tonight Show, put Lenny Bruce on The Tonight Show, was a was a champion of this stuff, and then did a complete 180 and became a finger-wagging scold. Uh, He was on The Simpsons and uh, went on The Simpsons, did a voice, took the check, cashed it, and then turned right around and said that The Simpsons were leading American children down a moral sewer. Wow. So one day, uh, uh, I'm walking across the Fox lot while an employee of said show with uh, my friend Tim Long, another employee of the show. Mm -hmm. And we saw Steve Allen in like an old convertible car, like a 69 Pontiac convertible, like this land yacht, Uh this giant wig. (laughs) And we were annoyed that he took our money and then shat on us. And then Tim Long shouted across the Fox lot, Steve Allen, you suck. <laughs> Steve Allen slams on the brakes, of his car, <laughs> backs up and starts driving over to where we are. And we, two grown men, <laughs> run. <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, 
terrified children <laughs> <laughs> and then watched them drive around looking for us. Oh my God. That uh, was hysterical. It was amazing. Um, uh, yeah, it was sad what happened to him. Well, I do love Steve Allen. I'm just in the book, you know, speaking the facts. And I should say that despite the attitudes that changed in Steve Allen and other people like Mae West and Billy Wilder, I love them all. Yeah, and, I know. And, and it's know. just a factual thing that happened that they I love charlton heston I, he said some things i don't agree with yeah but yeah. when i met him he couldn't have been nicer to me yeah, yeah <laughs> that yeah. counts for something yeah yeah the hope is that we you know we all start off fozzy bear we don't all have to turn into statler and waldorf yeah good point yeah guys from Oxford, three guys from Cambridge, and a cartoonist from America. Terry Jones and Michael Palin met at Oxford University, where they performed with the Oxford Review. Graham Chapman and John Cleese attended Cambridge University, where they performed with the famous Cambridge University Footlights. Eric Idle was a year behind them. The five of them first worked together in 1966, when they all found themselves on British television's The Frost Report. Now, The Frost Report, starring David Frost, was a satire of that week in the news. Clearly descended from an earlier Frost program, that was the week that was. From The Frost Report, Eric Idle, Terry Jones, and Michael Palin moved on to another show called Do Not Adjust Your Set, where they met a young American named Terry Gilliam, who was working there as an animator. After that show, Thames Television offered them their own late-night sketch show. But at the very same time, the BBC offered John Cleese and Graham Chapman their own two-man show. But Cleese was leery of doing a show just with Graham Chapman, who could be erratic and difficult to work with. Graham Chapman was brilliant. He was a comedy genius and had a medical degree. He was literally a doctor, but he chose to do comedy instead. Cleese wanted to work with Chapman, but not just with Chapman. He also wanted to work with Michael Palin. Palin also wanted to work with Cleese, but suggested that his friends Terry Jones and Eric Idle come along. Eric Idle then suggested, do not adjust your set's Terry Gilliam's animation would be a great addition to any projected series. On May 11th, 1969, these six men met at a restaurant and a television series was born. Its name, Owl Stretching Time. It would go through several other potential names, including the toad elevating moment, a horse, a spoon, and a basin, the Vaseline review, etc., etc., etc. Finally, they settled on Monty Python's Flying Circus. Now, it's important to remember how important Monty Python was to comedy. The show's influence has been described as being as important to comedy as the Beatles' influence was onto music. And and that's not wrong. The Pythons came from sketch writing. Their show was a sketch show. But the members bristled over the facts that sketches had to conclude. They needed to have a satisfying ending that was on story for the sketch. But rarely, if ever, was the ending of the sketch also the peak of the sketch. As a result... Sketches seemed to go on for too long. So the Pythons decided to just 
quit the sketch after the funniest joke. This was done in a number of ways. The players in the sketch would turn to camera and bail. Graham Chapman would enter dressed as a military colonel and call the sketch to a halt. A 16-ton weight would drop onto the cast. Usually, the sketch would somehow segue to Terry Gilliam's Baroque animation, and somehow it would find its way in a new sketch. Now, the Pythons were not the first to do this. Irish comedian Spike Milligan from The Goon Show would often, on his own show, walk out of sketches halfway through muttering, Did I write this? But it was the Pythons that showed it to the world. The show was comprised of three writing groups that each had their own style. John Cleese and Graham Chapman, both from Cambridge, would write sketches that had a hard edge to them. The argument sketch, the parrot sketch, any sketch where one character hurls a torrent of abuse at another character. These sketches were written by Cleese and Chapman. Michael Palin and Terry Jones from Oxford wrote together, but their sketches were more avant-garde. As John Cleese wrote in his memoir, Most of the sketches with heavy abuse were Graham's and mine. Anything that started with a slow pan across the countryside and impressive music was Mike and Terry's. End quote. Eric Idle wrote largely without a partner. A great example of an Idle sketch was The Man Who Spoke Only in Anagrams. Again, as Cleese wrote, Anything that got utterly involved with words and disappeared up any personal orifice was Eric's. End quote. And the animation was all Terry Gilliam. Monty Python's Flying Circus premiered on the BBC on October 5th, 1969, and became a huge and well-deserved hit. Now, the late 60s and early 1970s was the heyday of the British rock aristocracy. The Beatles were still together. The Who, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd. These were very groovy, very, very wealthy dudes. And they were all huge Python fans. And that is an important point to keep in mind for later. Monty Python's Flying Circus ran on the BBC from October of 1969 to December of 1974. What many people don't realize is that when the show began to catch on in America, it was already over in the UK. It was first broadcast on a PBS station in Dallas, Texas, of all places, during the summer of 1974. When the ratings came in, the management of the station thought that there'd been a mistake. They had never seen numbers that big. Soon, Monty Python's Flying Circus was airing on PBS stations all across the country. And if you were hip and in the know, you began memorizing Monty Python's sketches. Everyone from Elvis Presley to 11-year-old kids in Massachusetts were reciting the spam sketch by heart. This initial burst of fame coincided with the Python's first proper movie. Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I say proper because there was a Python film that was released a couple years earlier called And Now for Something Completely Different. But that film was just a collection of refilmed sketches from the show. And this was done to expose the Pythons to people around the world. And in that regard, it worked. Monty Python and the Holy Grail was a straightforward, consistent narrative story, although broken down into sketches, parodying the legend of King Arthur and his search for the Holy Grail. Despite the film's epic look, it was shot on a shoestring budget, $2 million in today money. But these guys didn't even have that. How did they raise the money? Well, in part, they raised it thanks to the generosity and support of their wealthy rock star superfans. Monty Python and the Holy Grail was brought to you in part by Pink Floyd, Jethro Tull, and Led Zeppelin. Monty Python and the Holy Grail was a huge global hit that cemented the Pythons as the leading comedy group in the world. They were also, like the Beatles, the group that was setting the bar for everyone else. During the press junket for Monty Python and the Holy Grail, the group were often asked what their next movie would be called. Eric Idle, just trying to be funny, once wisecracked 
that their next film was going to be called Jesus Christ, Lust for Glory. The germ for the film came from an idea for a sketch, again by Idol, where Jesus' cross falls apart and Jesus angrily berates the sloppy carpenters who built it, instructing them how to fix it as they went. Again, if you remember, Jesus was a carpenter. Now, none of the pythons were what you would call believers, but they were all very well-read, very well-educated. And as they began to write the film, they realized that even though they weren't believers, that as far as Jesus' teachings were concerned, there was really nothing to make fun of. Whether you believe that Jesus was the Son of God or not, they all agreed he seemed to be a really decent dude and that his message was A-OK. So they abandoned the idea of a parody of the life of Christ and they switched it to, to the story of a guy named Brian Cohen who was mistaken as the Messiah and who had no desire to be the Messiah. The first draft of the script was called The Gospel According to St. Brian. After several rewrites, the film bore its new title, Life of Brian. The film was being financed by the British entertainment company EMI. And one Wednesday evening, the chairman of EMI, Lord Bernard Delfont, finally sat down and read the script. He was horrified. The following morning, a Thursday, EMI pulled out of the production. The problem? The crew was to begin leaving for the location in Tunisia two days later on Saturday. Production was halted. Now, the budget for the film was about $4 million, which is about $17 million today. The Pythons got half of the money from United Artists. Great, but they were still down a cool $2 million. Enter the Beatles. Well, enter George Harrison, formerly of the Beatles. Harrison was a huge Python fan and was determined to find a way to, as he said to his business partner, Dennis O'Brien, help my mates. Harrison took out a second mortgage on his estate, Friar Park, and then he and O'Brien formed a company to help produce Life of Brian called Handmade Films. The film got made and upon its release got largely great reviews. Python's legions of fans love the movie, but Catholics and Christians, at least the business arms of Catholicism and Christianity, hated it. Not that they had seen it or knew what it was about, but details, details, details. In the UK, several town councils banned the film from being shown. Again, they hadn't seen it. Many of these town councils didn't have a theater in which to show it if they did want to. But what does that matter? A group called the Nationwide Festival of Light, a Christian evangelical group, was ready to tell anyone who wanted to listen how horrible and sacrilegious the life of Brian was. The town council of Harrogate banned the film, which it had not seen, on the advice of the Nationwide Festival of Light, which it had never heard of. The film was banned in Ireland for eight years. It was banned in Norway for four years. In nearby Sweden, it was advertised as the film so funny it was banned in Norway. In America, Catholics, me at the time among them, were told that seeing the film was a sin. I saw it anyway. I was already full of sin. What was one more? In the UK, John Cleese and Michael Palin were invited onto the popular discussion program Friday Night, Saturday Morning and asked to defend the film in a discussion with Mervyn Stockwood, who held the title The Bishop of Southwark, and Malcolm Muggeridge, a satirist who had recently converted to Christianity. Now, Cleese and Palin were both admirers of Muggeridge, at least until the broadcast. Right out of the gate, it was revealed that the bishop and Muggeridge were 15 minutes late to the screening of the film and completely missed the film's single most important point, that Brian is not Jesus. And they began attacking Cleese and Palin for a film they didn't make. The outrage over life of Brian, like most tantrums, burned itself out as soon as attentions wandered. Life of Brian went on to become a critical and commercial hit. George Harrison made his money back and then some. Handmade films would go on to be a major force in British films for the next decade, making such classics as Mona Lisa, The Long Good Friday, Time Bandits, With Nail and I. 
The funniest story is set in the Welsh town of Aberystwyth, where the film had been banned for 30 years. In 2009, the town elected a new mayor, Sue Jones Davies. Now, Sue Jones Davies was an actress before she got involved in politics, and in fact, portrayed Brian's girlfriend, Judith Iscariot, in the film The Life of Brian. One of her first official acts as mayor was lifting the ban on the film. Good on you, Madam Mayor. Despite all the hubbub, genuine and manufactured, Life of Brian is currently included on many lists of the greatest film comedies of all time. And there's a lesson there, if you think about it. Always look on the bright side of life. Here's a wonderful new idea for Christmas fun. Now you can turn your home into a window wonderland with a magic of glass wax and a set of these easy-to-use cut-out stencils for glass wax. Why, it's so easy a child can do it. Just pour regular glass wax into a dish, dip in a sponge, and simply dab over one of the stencil designs. Put a jolly Santa like this on your windows in a matter of seconds or Christmas trees. Reese, Santa and his reindeer, all the lovely signs of Christmas that will make your home a window wonderland, all through the magic of glass wax and a set of these cut-out stencils for glass wax. Buy your set of Christmas stencils wherever you buy regular glass wax. Beautiful holiday designs to help make a window wonderland at your home this Christmas. Officer, what's the trouble? Yes, Lane? Yes? Double parking, blocking a hydrant, obstructing traffic. But I was only Christmas shopping. Christmas shopping? Just for a moment. In Chemical, New York, a bank? Why, yes, look. Some people like money for Christmas. <laughs> so who doesn't? For Groundhog Day, I like money. Well, Chemical New York has a nicer way to give it. You see, a personal checking account comes in this bright gift token. Inside, 100 name and printed checks. So personal. Yeah, maybe my 18-year-old would like Why, that. Why, yes. A son, a daughter, a wife, and just $10 or more starts the account. Now, uh, do I get that ticket? We'll let you off this time. <laughs> I'll be dropping in on you. Dropping in? Give money this nicer way. Another helping hand from Chemical New York. And now, on with the show. It is a sun dapple day high atop the Mulholland Drive view shelf here in uh, beautiful, sunny Southern California. Uh, we are talking to uh, somebody uh, who I know socially, but the more I researched you on a little thing called Wikipedia, the less about you I realized I knew. Mm. Um, but the reason that this interview came about, it was always pending. But we were talking about the Halloween episode that was our previous episode where we were talking about the famous monsters convention. Yes. And you said, oh, yeah, I was at that. Yeah. The Commodore Hotel. And I went, habita, habita, habita. What? <laughs> so let's dive into all that. Please welcome star of stage, screen and song. Stephen Weber. Hello, young people. <laughs> good looking young people hello pot pod listeners this mm. uh this by the way uh it's interesting podcasts are named after a uh a technological advance that is now outdated pods pods the ipods they don't do them oh that's right i guess so don't even they make don't, them anymore they but they don't refer to a shape or a like a congregation of well, they um, refer to the invasion of body snatchers, but that's right, not right, these right. refer. These were i iPods. These are made for your iPod. <laughs> what a goddamn nerd you are! Oh yeah. Well, here's the thing. So you're 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 born in New York, and I didn't know this. Uh, I I didn't know this until we uh, got to know each other. You're from a show business family, and you started you started working at about the age of three. 
Uh, no, not three. Uh, well, just to clarify, my father was a manager and agent of um, uh, Borscht Belt and local New York nightclub comedians and singers. His father was a well-known in that area uh, agent and manager who managed the young Jackie Gleason, managed wow. the young uh, Don Rickles. And but previous to that. And that, so there's your grandfather. That's my grandfather, Willie what Weber. Was his name? Willie, Willie Weber. Willie Weber. And he's in, he's in any, uh, credible Jackie Gleason biography of which there are several. But what fascinates me is that he was, you know, he was an orphan in Harlem at the turn of the 20th century and fell in with the Jewish mob as, uh, people you, know, do. you can see from board, as you do in boardwalk empire and, 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 and from there, Made the logical transition into show business, I guess. Became an agent. You know, he went to prison and uh, and then became an agent. And, and then my father, I guess, followed in his footsteps, not very willingly, but did. And um, and my mom was a nightclub singer. She was a copa girl in the 50s, you know, when it was wow. all very romantic and all that stuff. So that's the, the showbiz pedigree. It's not glamorous. It was, it hovered. They were, yeah, they were, well, they were middle class. Right, uh, right. People it, in show, which is most people in show business. Right. That, that's the whole thing about, we were talking about the strike. People assume that everybody's a billionaire. No, no. most people just want to pay their flipping rent. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and, and my father and mother, or my father really hovered closely to the, um, the kind of Broadway Danny Rose level of show business, not quite as seedy. Not as low rent, but it was it was very it was middle class and lower middle class, really. Yeah, a, yeah. People you know, just was, trying to get by. That's right. That's right. Yeah, but then you know, your yeah, for your grandfather, he was doing okay. Well, yes and no. I mean, they they were all well. Did he was, ride with Gleason and Rickles? No, into he their let, fame. No, or he, he really let, was Danny Rose. Well, but there was something. It was it was Danny Rose, but with an edge. He wasn't. He wasn't. Um, you know, he's sort of a mystery because I think he, I think he was a liaison between show business and the mob because the mob had a hand in most New York clubs, Copa, and 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 other clubs and uh, and I think that because he had done his time and had many contacts in uh, the the mob, he was kind of a he had his foot in both camps. You know, the camp camp and the death camp. <laughs> See what I just did there. And uh, um, well done, well done, and uh, and yeah, it was interesting. So, so he let them go mysteriously. I don't know why. It's probably good because two men, my grandfather, and my father, who could not have been less funny, were in charge of giving notes to comedians after they did their their that, goddamn set. That's, 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 that's so I, that's so par for the course. It's not even uh, worth mentioning. Is it really? <laughs> I mean, honestly, man, it's it's I, even as a kid, I noticed this kind of uh, this, this, you know, not detachment, but this it, it was incongruous. My well, father, funny, you know, I think ahead. my yeah. experience yes. is that people that are genuinely funny have no interest in authority. Hmm. They don't want to get, they don't want to get into a position of authority. Uh, and nine times out of 10, they only do it to protect their work. Like Billy, Billy Wilder became a director to protect his writing. Uh, that's why they, they move into a, a position of authority. And, uh, you know, uh, it's always the, uh, you know, usually the, you know, the network executives, the people that are giving notes and have the real authority, they tend not to be the funniest people. I suppose, I suppose, I, I guess I would, with exceptions. Well, With there are exceptions, exceptions obviously. But even even the, I guess, the worst of the suits in the previous incarnation of show business before, like, the current strike uh, version of things, which is all kind of corporate and show business, you know, the the industry is a kind of like a, a side hustle for these big corporate behemoths, Amazon, Apple, you know, they could give a shit, was that these the, the suits in the old days at least started in mailrooms at least mm -hmm. were in the orbit of production and so yeah, yeah, could, yeah. could kind of pick up things. They may not have had creative impulses themselves, but they were acquainted with them. They were neighbors to it. These other people apparently do not. So again, incongruously, my father, who was a Korean war veteran with PTSD, 
was advising comedians on I don't know what. <laughs> he had a yellow pad and he you know, lie and he would tell them to do it, uh, do the joke with the thing, yeah. thing and then then pause and I mean yeah, you take so it too know. long before the punchline. They're gonna come over that hill any minute. <laughs> They're gonna try. To, I want you to slit the audience's throat. And I want you to first put your hand over their mouth so they can't hear you. You can't hear so, them screaming. I don't know. So he saw he uh, he had uh, he saw he was a uh, saw a battle. He really did. Yeah, really? It's something. Yeah, it's something that I I came to understand many many years later. Yeah, uh, they didn't call it PTSD back then. I think it was uh, shell, shell shock. shock. Shell yeah. shock. Yeah. You yeah. know, and uh, and I, I mean, I'm sure we've discussed this, but talking about movies and stuff. Uh, did you ever see Five Came Back, which was a documentary about George Stevens? Yes, yes, um, yes, 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 yes. And uh, and John Huston had made this fantastic documentary called Let There Be Light, which, of course, the government suppressed for, I don't know, 40 years. And uh, in which they he really did an amazing job showing, um, you know, the plight of people, all people who go to war. It's a sham, isn't it? Oh, and one more thing. I'm, I'm digressing. You know, on YouTube, there is a fantastic short film made by the military. I think it's called, um, oh, I can't remember what it's called, but it, it's about, it's about shell shock and it's with Gene Kelly. Have you seen this? No. It's astonishing because Gene Kelly, who's already been an established star, is in this down and dirty government film about uh, anger and rage that is caused from PTSD and, and battle fatigue, battle fatigue. Battle and, fatigue. and, um, and he's amazing in it. He's great in it. He curses in it. I mean, or what passes for cursing. Right. God damn it. Jesus wow. Christ. And it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, it's a government issued film. It's well, a, like it, a, it's clearly like a, a government issued film. film. Like, if, well, like if, not, no, it doesn't have a narrator, like, but, oh, okay. but it, it's clearly government issued. It is scripted. Uh, I'm sure there are real soldiers in it or maybe, or some real uh, therapists in it, but we follow his journey as a guy who's been, um, uh, you know, um, he's, 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 uh, oh God, he's back home. And, uh, but I think the war is still going on, but he's back home and he's trying to be reinter, you know, integrated into his life and into his home life. And he starts drinking and screaming at people. And it's not the Gene Kelly that you know. It's not wow. anchors away. It's anchors far away. Good night, That's everybody. Fair. I just. Keep... Well, yeah, the Korean War, PTSD. So the famous monsters convention. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. you you grew up in New York, yeah. and you're. Uh, you're surrounded, you're eyeball deep in show business. Was there ever any chance that you would do anything other than show business? I mean, sort of, because it was, it, you know, it was never anything glamorous. It was just the world that I found myself in, that my right. family was in. And, uh, you know, yeah, like no, I, it was like, that's what I mean. Like, you, did you even see options? Ah, uh, you know, I don't think I did. And, and moreover, my parents didn't necessarily offer me options. They, they didn't encourage, nor did they discourage whatever trajectory I was on. But my trajectory was perf was informed, said performed by how performative I was in school as a, as a young age, uh -huh. doing, you know, Cagney imitations and Ed Sullivan imitations <laughs> to get a rise out of the adults that were mostly in my life. Right, and, right, uh, right. And that's when I started reading like film books and stuff and, and, and books about TV history. And uh, so I began to have conversations. I, I can have conversations with old pe older people and say, I knew who Pinky Lee was when I was 11. They're like, Pinky <laughs> Lee? You know, what? <laughs> Ding dong school. Yeah, and, that's and, exactly. And, and to, to kind of segue into Monster World, I mean, my, yeah. my, the seminal book I had was my father had this book called The Bad Guys by William K. Everson. And The Bad Guys, I think I have a copy of it somewhere, is this big picture book that had fantastic stills from... Uh, the silent era on, I guess, up to the sixties and hammer stuff. So it began to, you know, had that kind of nascent. Started with like Conrad Veidt and went all the way to Conrad Veidt. You know, it had yeah. Charles Ogle, the first <laughs> Frankenstein. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and the and Edison, the Edison Frankenstein. That's right. And uh, Nosferatu and all that stuff. And that's, and of course, I would read that where on the toilet. Sure, and and, and and for an hour, and that's where I really first got 
into monsters and and all that whole world cinema cinema monsters uh huh and so you're reading famous monsters like uh, a yeah. lot of the people that listen to this podcast yeah and you and you i don't we're i don't i don't know much about like i don't know as much about conventions as people think i do like yeah. I, don't, I don't know you know um it had to have been one of the, I know that they went back to the fifties. I know that Forrest Ackerman was going to like weird conventions in the, like the thirties and forties, but yeah, this seemed like the biggest thing I'd ever heard of at that well, time. Well, what I remember of it, and I guess I was, what year was it again? It was 74. 70, so you were like 12, 13, 12, 13. 13. Yeah. Uh, I actually recall that it was pretty low rent, pretty seedy. I mean, I've, I've done a, a bunch of, um, uh, autograph conventions in recent years, and they are fairly elaborate. Although there is that sure. kind of that seamy underbelly that that you know, oh weaves, I know weaves through, and but, and you see, and because of the strike, oh everybody's they, out, they, everybody's there now. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't get a, I can't get a booth. <laughs> I, I, I can't get there's, there. There's no folding tables to rent. Yeah. Harrison Ford. Yeah, I wanna, <laughs> that's right. Uh, <laughs> um and. Uh, but I remember going into the Commodore Hotel, which itself was a bit seedy. Remember yeah, the this? Commodore was not the most famous hotel in New York. And this was <laughs> New York in the early 70s when, you know, Ford to New York dropped dead. And it was, mug yeah, yeah, there was yeah, a yeah. mugger under every, you know, under every was that, step uh, you took. Was Now, Dinkins wasn't the mayor. That was no, after no, no, it was Abe Beam. It was probably Abe Beam. You know, this is. This was during yeah. This is like Sam and this yeah. Is, this is when New York went. From, oh, it was in the. This crapper. is when New York went from the New York City that people see it like the heyday of Mad Men <laughs> to right. the New York City from Taxi Driver. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And Taxi Driver made it look kind of fun and romantic. If you look at movies like, <laughs> the, if you look, look at, I never, I didn't say there's anything about that movie that isn't fun. <laughs> um, just the the amazing cinematography of that. But if you look at, uh, I want to say the French Connection. Or even if you've ever seen Hercules in New York with, I think, uh, Lou Schwarzenegger. No. Oh, I thought Lou Ferrigno was Hercules no, I think, in New York. You're right. No, you're right. It, it was one of his first movies, yeah. Well, there's a sequence, I've only seen it once, of a car chase in Central Park. And Central Park looks like a fucking, can I curse on this? Yes, it's okay. a podcast. Yeah, well, you, you said fricking or whatever. Uh, yeah. Well, that's because I'm a gentleman. You you are. <laughs> And a, and a lady. Uh, we'll get into I'm, that, too. I'm all and, things to all people. <laughs> well, these, these two cars, you know, these two Chevelles or whatever, are doing donuts Pace, on Pacers. Pacers on, <laughs> on what is now, you know, the, the the Sheep Meadow, which is beautifully curated. I mean, muddy donuts, and it's horrifying. It's terrible. Death Wish. It, it, that's what it was. Yeah, so yeah, the yeah. Commodore Hotel was kind of a crappy, you know, post-war hotel. And... The carpet, I remember, was crappy. I mean, I was lower to the carpet than I am now. And and there were booths. And it wasn't that elaborate. Uh, and, and I remember just getting or getting my grandparents who took me to buy me yeah. a rubber over-the-head mask of Frankenstein, which I wish I had right now. It would probably, there would be no colors on it left. Sure. It probably, who was, who was, was anybody there? Like, uh, I can't remember. Maybe that. Barbara Lee? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, you know. I, I don't remember any of that. I, 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 because my, my first taste of that whole genre is, was just purely visual. You know, I, I, I knew, I knew, uh, what they looked like and I became uh, a real Lon Chaney senior lunatic to this day. I still am. And so I, I, not junior, not junior, no senior. I, I began to appreciate junior later on, arguably around arguably, blazing stewardesses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or uh, cannibal orgy. Blazing <laughs> yeah. uh, suits. Uh, so sad. Um, but uh, no, I'm all like, all careers end in failure. I, I'm 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 edging toward. I saw it. I saw you at the meeting. It's all right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It is inter it is interesting too. That's true. You know, Which and part? it's not just show business. It's everybody in life. It what you, all you, careers you, end horribly? No, not horribly, but. You you have a peak and then you keep going. Oh well, and you know Obama. Obama. <laughs> That's right. He he was done, and then <laughs> I guess you so. know. No, look, yeah, there are observable peaks and stuff. Yeah. I mean, some uh, are not as ignoble and. Yeah, and alcohol and drenched. Uh, yeah, that's what I mean. Especially yeah. if like someone like Lon Chaney Jr. You are, as they like to uh, say, a tippler. 
Uh, <laughs> you made some questionable decisions. Scream! It's the Tippler. <laughs> Love that movie, Vincent Price. Was that? Was it you that was talking about uh, when he was doing Blazing Stewardesses, or he was doing it? Lon yeah. Chaney Jr. was doing an Al Adamson movie, and they got J. Carol Nash in the movie. Uh, Did you tell me this story? No, no, no. Because it's on it. our it's on our thread. So yeah. it, J. Carol Nash and Lon Chaney Jr. are both doing a a very low rent Al Adamson movie. I think it's like the Castle of Frankenstein or something. As my father would say, they both have one foot in the grave and the other on a banana peel. And uh, I guess just sitting in the dressing room or gr- makeup, whatever, and Lon Chaney Jr. goes, Well, Jay. I guess we're going to be dead soon. <laughs> and Jay Carroll Nash goes, shut up, Lon. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Look, uh, there's a famous story. I don't know if it's apocryphal of, in their later years, Don Adams talking to Harvey Corman. You know, it's probably the 90s. Uh-huh. And the extent of this story is Don Adams looks at Harvey Corman and he says, Harvey, it's all over <laughs> and that's it and to me that says so much you could just see them just they're going yeah it is my my fascination and dawn is a part of this is i want to really do either the documentary or the dramatization of like the last 12 months of the playboy mansion oh my god yeah like just the gothic baroque Great. Um, uh, 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 it should. It could be called minimal expectations. <laughs> <laughs> it's so horrible. Just like a, a wedding cake full of Viagra. Is <laughs> well, <laughs> I actually had my one. I had a visit there once. Did you ever go I, there? I did. Yes. Sure. Okay. World's the world's saddest zoo. Oh my god. <laughs> Uh, my friend. That's what I. That's what I looked at too. It wasn't. I mean, I saw the grotto between. I was like, those birds look so sad. Oh, uh, okay. So birds. we had a similar. We had a similar experience. So my my good buddy Spencer Garrett, who's a great actor, who's always uh, he used to rock a bow tie and spectacles and was still you know getting laid yeah. wow. all over the place. I was like, yeah, yeah. I used to call him the unlikely coxman, and I said, <laughs> you know, because he was just it was amazing. He I'm just got, I'm, I'm I'm imagining Arnold Stang uh, just with an not, a not as of nerdy. Ladies. That was like a, <laughs> it, no, he was just he. Okay, he looked more like um uh from Mad Monster Party. Oh, the goalie. Oh, oh sure. okay. <laughs> what was his name? He used to the, cough and and then spray. The guy who's uh, basically doing uh he's basically the guy he's doing his voice doing Jimmy Stewart. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> and he would cough and yeah. yeah. So he kind of looked like that, but handsome. Did Hanna Barbera do the Mad Monster Party? No, come on, that's um, Rankin Bass. Rankin Bass, of course. I, that, but Hanna Barbera would just like blatantly steal. Like, oh, uh, yeah, Top does. Cat is just Bilko. Yes. I just do it. What are they yeah. gonna do? Sue us? <laughs> Which should. man? Thank God they did. I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah. That the they Flintstones did that, is the Honeymooners. Uh, so honeymooners just that's right. do it. That's right. Just copy it. The so, Jetsons right, so is uh, I don't know what the Donna Reed Show. Ah, there you go. Okay, smart. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so you go to the Playboy Mansion. Oh, so so it's it's um a pajama themed pajama bedtime thing. I'm like, great. You know, I've never been. Uh, and I was married at the time. I was like, okay, let's go. You know, and and it's every every male fantasy. I'm gonna go to. It's like the Acker Mansion, which we'll get in later. Yeah. Okay, this is the um, go to the Playboy Mansion after reading about it and jerk. I mean, reading about it. <laughs> And the grotto and the girls. Sure. All right. So we drive. Bill Cosby. Up. Bill Cosby. Jimmy Kahn. So Con. just ho- just wholesome. <laughs> Jimmy Kahn with his satchel full of dildos. Oh um, man, I saw Jimmy Kahn once at the Improv with Andrew Dice Clay, and they were both wearing leather jackets. Car sized jackets, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, the, and the, the only, yeah, yeah, the other person <laughs> I saw wearing one of those jackets was at the Grove. I saw Larry King wearing a leather Lakers jacket that looked like its weight was going to push him through the concrete. So James Conn is sitting at the improv with some young lady and Andrew Dice Clay, and then Andrew gets up to go on and 
James Conn turns over and he goes, you know, it's the difference between Andrew and all these other clowns. Andrew's timing is perfect. <laughs> and then I was with I was with your friend and mine, the late, great Kevin Rooney. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Rooney turned to me and he said, you know, there was a time when James Conn didn't have to be seen at the improv with Andrew Dice Clay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Leave no, it amazing. to Kevin. To uh, that's so brilliant. Pop the balloon. <laughs> did you ever read Kevin's? Uh, Kevin did this whole, he wrote several things about um, a, a, a fictional guy, I forget his name, who on D-Day got, <laughs> yes, his, got his first blowjob on D-Day, on the beaches. In, of in, like, in a murder hole. <laughs> I you know. When I read this, I could not, I, my head blew up. It was so yeah. outrageously funny. Yeah, was, you know, Kevin and also, the, you know, 20 years Kevin too early. Kevin was the James Joyce of Battlefield. Oh, my God. I, it was incredible when I was watching, when I was reading. Um, wait, what was yes. the thing? What were we talking about? But we were, okay, we were oh, talking about the Playboy, Playboy Mansion. Yeah, so Playboy I go Mansion. there, go to the Playboy Mansion, drive up, all excited. I'm wearing these pajamas. Spencer's in his pajamas. And we walk in and... The first five seconds, it's a spectacle. It's like Disneyland. Wow, yeah. it's happening. And then you begin to see what it's, what's really going on. It's like it's like Disneyland when they turn the lights on or Magic yeah, Mountain. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. Oh, wait a second. Or if you've ever been to a restaurant during the day, that at night is really <laughs> sexy. But during the day, it's like, oh, this is yeah, this disgusting. Car uh, this carpet, does, <laughs> does, oh, the grotto does, the CD, like, does the CDC know about this carpet? <laughs> the, the grotto was essentially bra. <laughs> and, and 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 then and then to my left, hanging yeah. out together in pajamas, was Chuck McCann. Trying to think of else, like all these all these actors, these old dudes that I loved, loved. Yeah, who sure, probably yeah. in the sixties came to this place when it was really happening, and they were really all happening, young, yeah. and everybody was. And then the and so I, I I said hello to a couple of people. I used to know Chuck McCann, which was great. Yeah, and then you uh, knew him from your medicine cabinet. From my medicine, I was like, hi, guy. <laughs> no one uh, gets But I that. actually met You no and I are the it. only people that No one get gets it. it. No one gets it. Okay. I said to Spencer, okay, well, let's, we're here. Let's walk around. And we skirted the kind of perimeter of the grotto because you did not want to get wet at all. No. And there were people frolicking in it, but they were looking like they were Because if you frolic. had a cut on your toe, <laughs> your foot could get pregnant. <laughs> That's right. Um, and... And the girls, such as they were, were all utterly disinterested and looking at, I guess this was, uh, I guess this was in the early 2000s, looking at whatever PDAs or they were just utterly yeah. disinterested and, and they, they were cute, but they couldn't give a shit. And the only women, I guess, so that were who paid any sort of cursory attention to me were the bunnies from the 60s and 70s and 80s who were older. Yeah. And pleasant. And, uh, and, and you could talk to him. And you could talk to him. Married to Jimmy Connors and having a good time. <laughs> she was my favorite, Patty Connors. Sure. A gorgeous woman. A gorgeous woman. Anyway, so that's Patty that. McGuire would be her. Patty uh, McGuire, yeah. Right. Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> I don't want to talk that, about this anymore. Beyond that said. Yeah, but no, but it, it, and it is, uh, I wonder for the young, the young ladies that were with Hefner at that time, where he really was the crypt keeper. I mean, oh, he must he, have it been. was, and the stories, I don't want to repeat them because they're pretty grim, mm. but uh, they're out there. You can read them. It, it, it was just like, go sit on grandpa's lap. For, only you're naked and grandpa has a Viagra. And it, but you literally just sit on his lap for a minute and then you're done. Yeah. It's fine. Come back out. You can have some cobbler. I mean, in a way, uh, a just, cobbler. <laughs> and oh, then cobbler. don't forget, tomorrow night, Don Adams is coming over and we all have to yeah. pretend we want to watch it happen one night. Like he would run <laughs> these old <laughs> movies and go, oh, this is what comedy really was. Yeah. 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 Uh, Hugh, it's all over my chest. I can't do Hugh Efner, but I can do Jim Turner doing Tell Us Wonder Sweet, which is his salute to Hugh Efner. Jim Turner, I love Jim. You know, Jim, you know Jim Turner? I do, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there used to be a stage show. It was the first, when I first moved to LA, I was taken to see this stage show. And to me, it was just like, I will never, ever be this cool. Uh, it was at Theater Theater. Yeah. Which is now the Greyhound bus station. Yeah. And it was Jim Turner and Mark Fight and uh, Nick Bakai, B uh, Billy the Mime, Steve Higgins, and a couple other people. And it was called the, 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 girly, the girly Magazine Party. 
Mm -hmm. And it was a parody of Playboy After Dark. Right. Which was a and, which is a great show to watch. If, uh, yeah. if not just because it's an artifact, yeah, it's really fascinating. It's this good, interesting really people. Yeah, and and Jim was played Tellus Wondersweet, the publisher of um, Jaunt magazine. <laughs> Jaunt, and his other titles: Slattern and Goo. <laughs> yeah, but it was like the rules to be a Jaunt gent. And like uh, it was all perfect, and he was like, we have a, and like they had a band. It was uh, something. The the band leader's last name was Priapic. That's what I remember. <laughs> and uh, and it was just like that's one of the many exciting sound paintings we're going to be hearing tonight. Oh, <laughs> you know, so amazing, everything. amazing. Yeah, it was you so know, that was perfect. It was so. Perfect. When did and you come out? When did you come out to? Uh, I came LA? out to move to LA in eighty nine, and this was uh, in the early nineties. Later, uh, I I did. Uh, get uh, into the cast of the girly magazine party and felt like more than anything else, like, well, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I've arrived. Ah, God. Um, I, I came out here around the same time, 88, 89. And one of the first things I did was uh, uh, we went to uh, an estate sale of what was Rudy Valley's uh, wow. estate, which was up in Nichols Canyon. And it was a real Norma Desmond epic house with a screening room and old wow. projection you know, projectors and cans of film. And by the by the time I got there, it was already picked you know, through. And yeah. And his last wife, uh, surviving wife was still was, for sale. <laughs> well, she was behind a bar. They had, you know, those the kind of typical I guess fifties, sixties bars that were uh -huh. almost on wheels. And she was she was a tough looking customer. She was and she was, I guess, Rudy's last wife. And the only thing I was able to buy were postcards of he and her in bed with their five shih tzus. And he was oh, ancient boy. and she was younger. Less than ancient. Less than ancient and but still very but up up close, tough, like bad skin, a short Blonde haircut, smoking a cigarette and a sure. can a can of beer. I'm not even kidding. God watching her, yeah. watching everyone pick over the bones of the fuck. Oh, of, you what know, a this. weird day that's gonna be. Ooh. Is the but, beer in a koozie? Please say yes. I don't think so. I think I yeah. oh I wanna say it was a can of Schlitz, but that was this was the the you know, eighty nine. I think Schlitz yeah. was already gone by then. They, don't they still make Schlitz? Why did you have to say it in such a high pitched voice? That's Where? what I'm curious about something. <laughs> I just got scary. a uh, I just got a uh, a link yesterday to buy Narragansett uh, Narragansett beer apparel. Narragansett need... beer was New England only, oh. famous for its appearance in Jaws. Oh, Quint okay. is drinking Narragansett. How about they? Uh, they actually my have. Dad would drink. They actually have retro candy for sale, and it's yeah. not old, but I mean, it's, yeah. it's old brand. Right. But they you made... can get a box of Quisp. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Or, you know, like a bottles, wax bottles filled with colored sweet liquid. Oh, I remember those. Yeah. You know what I really miss? And I, w I want it just for the old Wax factory. lips? <laughs> it's close. Uh, the orange wax Halloween harmonica. Oh, my God. Wow. Ugh. Yeah. Uh. Just to, I just want to smell it. And and yeah, you know, and they used to say, and it's also chewing, chewable. Yeah, no, and yeah. we would chew it. Oh uh, yeah, like it's chewable. Wow, well, yeah. it, it was it was soft and gooey. Yeah, all that stuff. Buttons yeah, on just, paper. Just... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Dots. I think they were called the dots. Dots. Hilarious. So, but um, yeah, so you ahead. get in. You're you're. Uh, I didn't know this. You started out on the as the world turns yeah. with Julianne Moore. She were we were uh, a team. She was on it a little bit. What year is me. this? Like mid eighties. Yeah, eighty. I want to say eighty six, eighty six, eighty seven. And I didn't uh, know she was. I didn't know she was in on a soap. But I guess everybody starts on a soap. If you're not only was she unlike on a soap, me, a real actor. That's right. Who is a stranger to soap? Is that funny how that works out? Mm -hmm. Well, not really. Oh, what? And uh, but she actually won uh, an Emmy for her work on on the soap, playing twins. But I, by that time, had been fired. Uh, we were a couple uh, for about seven, eight months, and um, I played a uh, blue collar Yale graduate named Kevin Gibson, and I had an earring which was very kind of 
rough, yeah. rough Shocking. trade. Well, sh- yeah, especially for a, for a soap opera. Soap in the, opera. In the, the mid 80s. And, uh, and then I was. And she I had was, ginormous red hair? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think it was beehive or anything like that, but we were young and there's still. But that's a see big gig. Of, right? It was a big gig, man. I had. For, I was pulling if you're down, a New York actor and you're on a soap, you're working regular. I used to look at my check for $850 a week. And I'm not saying that to be cute. I was, I would, I still would not turn that down. But at the time, no. <laughs> I was living with two other roommates in a windowless loft in Long Island City. And I'd get on the seven yeah. train and look at this oh. and I'd be like, God damn, man. Yep. This was awesome. And I also worked in this environment, which I loved. And I'm sure you would too. It's, it, it, you, it, it was the old fashioned, um, television production. Uh, sure, companies, sure. Uh, guys on cameras that moved around. Um, a um, uh, you know, like a, a yeah, little, no, it was a like a booth like, with with people snapping. You could, oh, pretend, camera yeah, one, you camera could two. pretend you were on Playhouse ninety. Well, it, it, it effectively all the tools in Playhouse ninety were still intact. It hadn't mm-hmm. gone digital. It was still that world, and I was in heaven. Wow. And it was in the same facility that uh, sixty minutes was shot in. And I, on one occasion, I actually took a leak next to Mike Wallace in the men's room. <laughs> uh, luckily, we were separated by little kind of partitions. Those little things, I, yeah. I wanted to turn to him and say, biography. <laughs> and see, but I did not have the guts. I took a leak next to Larry King at Dan Tanis. That's the second Larry King, really? Yeah. Was he wearing well, a big yeah, leather coat? Larry, not that night. Yeah, but, that's uh, a good... But yeah. well, speaking of which... Was it in this, the bathroom or was it just at you know the table? This, no, it was, it was at Dan Tannis. Larry had a problem. Do you know what this t-shirt is? The Blue Whale. Um, yeah. I don't. Speaking of soap operas, this is the bar on Dark Shadows. Oh, my God. Okay, Dark Shadows. I used to love watching Dark Shadows. Sure. <laughs> yeah. That Quentin was a, and Jonathan Frid. Yeah, you and yeah, that and that was... You know, we were talking about in the last... Uh, episode, you know, the, the monster boom that gave it a huge kick in the ass. That's in right. The late sixties. That's right. He was the groovy vampire and he's great in it, but the show is really almost unwatchable. It's, well, it's it, well, it's watchable for what it is. It's like, yeah, it, you know, it, it, it is Brigadoon on a dollar 99. So true. it's like, it's like, it oh, is, well, great. It is. Yeah. And also, it doesn't take off until he actually is on the show. And he yes. hadn't was on the show for, I don't know how many Two episodes. Year, yeah, like Two year years, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and then he really took off. Then he was kind of fantastic. I mean, really well, the, great at what he did. Yeah, the thing that was interesting is a weird sidebar, but like he, in terms of the way vampires are portrayed in movies, he was something really new. Yeah. Which was, and now what he did is almost standard, but mm-hmm. he, he invented it and it wasn't in the script. It was him. What? He was guilt ridden and self conscious. And it's because Jonathan Frid was fucking terrified because he was a theater actor. He was right. a very slow study. He never knew his lines. He was in way over his head. He was way yeah. out of his depth. And he's like, when you see me, that's not people thought Barnabas was nervous and scared. It's because I was fucking terrified. Oh, that's, and that's but that played. And yeah. who was he playing for? Teenagers. I guess so. So or that's or, how ha- housewives. Yeah. Wasn't it housewives? Who well, were yeah, home? but teenagers caught on when right, he right, came right. on the show. It became a teeny bopper thing. He was on the cover of Tiger Beat. I guess and so. that teenagers related to it. And then that became the standard. Yeah. Like, well, that's a very and this is just a weird nerdy thing that uh I noticed when Francis Ford Coppola remade Dracula. Yeah. To set it apart from all the other versions of Dracula, they said, well, this is Bram Stoker's Dracula. This is the book. Right. And in the book, Dracula is madly in love with Mina because she is the reincarnation of his first wife. That's not the book. That's yeah, not in the book. Yeah. It's Dark Shadows. Oh, yeah. It is literally Dark Shadows. Not that. Yeah. Had nothing to do with the book. Yeah. Jonathan Frid. <laughs> but people, but you know why people think it's the book? Because they said it was. They said it was. So people go, okay. Goddamn Francis Coppola. Yeah. All right. Who, I guess you're right. 
But you got into, <laughs> but you got into that. Like, as you were a genre kid, and you yeah. did you pursue roles in the genre because you've done a lot of genre work. Um, only when I was, or did you just fall into it? Only when I was able to. Uh, you know, once I had started doing, I want to say, um, Wings uh-huh. is when I had whatever minimal latitude I had. Uh, How many seasons was Wings on? Was that? I want to say eight. S- yeah, seven or eight. Yeah, with yeah. a young Steve Levitan. <laughs> That's right. And Chris Lloyd and uh, a bunch yep. of great writers uh, were yep. on that show. And uh, um, it was a great, it was a great place. And, uh, and, and uh, amazing. Like everybody from that cat, Tony Shalhoub. Tony Shalhoub, Tom, Tom Church, uh, Amy Yazbek, who's married yeah. to John Ritter and, and Tim Daly, of course. Yep. Uh, David Schramm, Crystal Bernard, underrated. Uh, yeah, it was, it was great. I did yeah. a Bob Hope special with Crystal Bernard. You did. Oh, that's yeah. right. She was, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, I do not know should, where. Should, by yeah. the way, we should be sitting at a shuffleboard. I did a Bob Hope special I with Chris Bob Hope. You know what she was? A professional. <laughs> she was. She was the working man's Angie Dickinson. <laughs> she was a performer. She was uh, a performer. Yeah, she's uh, a lovely, la- lovely lady. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, and so I, you had a little juice. You had a little juice from Wings, and you're like, yeah, I want to do some horror movie. Well, so but the first thing I was able to do was, uh, for some reason, I don't know how the opportunity came my way, but I was able to uh, direct an episode of The Outer Limits, which was being remade in one, yeah. Canada. Yeah, and um, had you and, directed Wings? No, no, no. That's a totally different. As I know it's, it's a, but 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 they wouldn't care as long. No. As, what had you directed? Nothing. Wow, and they let you do it. That's pretty yeah. Cool. I mean, I don't even know. I don't know how I got it, but I, I get. A, I guess I made a pitch. I, sure. I, I, and and I, I, I shot listed it. I did all these things. Yeah, and, I, yeah. and we're so prepared. That was successful. They gave you a good DP, and they, they did. In fact, I would say to him, "Can we do a, a Kubrick like movement?" And I would show him a scene from something, and he'd say, yeah. "Yes, we can do that." And I didn't know anything <laughs> about lenses. Should um, be neither. Yeah, I still don't. But you know what? In a way. I'm not talking about being a great director, but look, at the bare minimum, if you have a film, a filmic vocabulary, as I'm sure any cinematographer would, you can have a conversation and they'll, they will interpret. Yeah. What you well, want. The, the ultimate example is Greg Toland and Orson Welles. Orson Welles didn't know what he was doing. That's right. Toland, yeah. That's right. So, Toland, yeah, we can do God, that. We do it this way. Yeah. 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 Um, no, no, no one who has done anything has never done it before until they finally did it. I guess so. Yes, I guess right. so. Yeah. There's so much money at stake and uh, an ego yeah. too that it's hard to it's hard to get away with that stuff now. I mean, at the time, cable was nothing. I mean, I, I did this. Uh, uh, the Outer Limits was uh, what was that? Showtime or one of those things? And yeah, it was on Showtime. It was on Showtime, and so and I got to know the guy who was the head of Showtime, a fellow named Jerry Offsay, who was really mm-hmm. kind and lovely. Uh, but it, this was before cable was sexy in any way, right? And, uh, right. And so Before the like, non televised Cable Ace Awards. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yeah. My my wife has one. Um. But uh but I think I'd done the shining. I don't know when I did the shining, maybe nineteen ninety or something, but I was starting to pursue this mm-hmm. particular genre again after years of loving famous monsters and and eerie and creepy yeah. and all that stuff. And, know, and, and just knowing all that stuff. Knowing all of it and knowing knowing about Jack Pierce and knowing about the Westmores and knowing about Gordon Bow and knowing, you know, <laughs> all that shit. You know, and uh, all Evelyn that stuff. Anchors. <laughs> Evelyn Anchors. Like uh, uh, my Morris Ankrum. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, um, oh God. There's so, there's so uh, many. There's so many of them. You know, who? Uh, um, uh, he was in Star Trek, a great Star Trek episode. And his brother was, I think, on like this island earth or the flesh oh, the, eaters uh, jeff morrow not jeff morrow but they're in the same world yeah, yeah, yeah. His, his name will come to me remember right. Rhodes reason that's it in fact Rhodes reason and rex reason and that's who <laughs> that's i was thinking a, of that's, that's it and and rex reason was in this great Are they twins uh i don't know i can't let's ask like, them. not another people are like not another fucking podcast about the reason brothers <laughs> oh that's right <laughs> and it's well, that and murders <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Rhodes, who was in King Kong Escapes? Was that Rhodes Reed? I think oh that was Rhodes Reed. Oh my God. Oh my God. With, with the Japanese actor who was also in. Um, whose, whose character's name? Yeah, who's, who's also in uh, Ghidra the Three. He seems to have no lower teeth. That's and right. And a terrible. Okay. Yeah. And. Yeah. And he's in he, What's Up, Tiger Lily? He's in What's Up, Tiger Lily? He's in uh, Ghidra the Three Headed Monster. Oh, that's hilarious. And 
his name in King Kong Escapes is Dr. No, <laughs> which is like. As in no shame. As, as in that worked for, that worked, we'll take it. Yeah. And all those actors are in You Only Live Twice. Because it was also shot at oh my Toho. God. Well, that's it was amazing. All, it's shot that's in right. there, all just walking and, and around. In fact, you know who's in that too is um, yes, I know who you're going to say. The Rock's grandfather. Uh, no, no, but that's true. That's not who I was going. The Rock's grandfather, unless the guy, the Rock's grandfather is the guy that played Cato in the uh, Pink Panther films. No, but the uh, no, he's in it. Oh, is he, he really? He wow. is uh, a Quoak, a Bert Quoak. Look, at, look how these things look might, at this. Might, this all fantastic. the tubes fire when I with specific people I can think of specific things sure Quoke, cause it's, and he's, he's and he uh, was Cato in the Peter Sellers Pink Panther movie yes yes the guy that Bond fights in the office of Osato Chemicals with it he beats him up with a couch oh yeah the, the yeah. first oh, big that, fight is that that's Dwayne? the Rock's grandfather yeah 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 he yeah. Up with, oh, yeah he beats him up with that's a couch right. I mean those movies the, as sorry, a movie man, I like to describe as well no, that movie is, I like to describe it as bracingly racist. <laughs> well, it, it, it's okay. It's almost acceptable until they want to turn Bond, Bond Japanese. Japanese. And basically they used <laughs> Mickey Rooney's surgeon, I guess, from <laughs> but the Breakfast surgeons, and Tiffany's. It's like, the surgeons are a group of women in bikinis. Oh, my the, God. The surgeons are in a weird, like, uh, they're like in a weird observatory room with a giant roof. And it's just like six women in bikinis. I mean, <laughs> the ones doing the surgery. Well, because Screen it's more sanitary written, that way. Screenplay written by Roald Dahl. How about that? And uh, turns out to yeah, be another no, crazy racist lunatic as well. Yes. Right? Oh, of yeah. course. Yeah. The other crazy racist thing in that movie is when James Bond, who is British, tells the head of the Japanese Secret Service how sake is best served. Oh God, <laughs> it's so awful. I mean, yeah, you know, there are many things about having the mask taken off or the veil lifted that are discomforting. But holy shit! I mean, I to 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 understand. To see a lot of the James Bond films that used to be so venerated as as being really lousy films. Look, I recently saw Diamonds Are Forever because when that first came <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah, that doesn't age well. Holy smokes. When it first came out, I, by myself, at a time when I could take oh, myself my on God. the bus it at was, 11. It was like Star Wars. I saw it three times in the theater. I just didn't come yeah. home and you could just stay there. Yeah. I hadn't seen it in years because I remember there was a, what I thought was a great fight scene in a in a in an elevator where he looks at his sure. watch. And oh, he, that I think that is that's good pretty good. Scene. That is good. Yeah, the rest of it is beyond garbage. It should be James <laughs> Bond beyond garbage. Well, it's it's now we're gonna get like it. It is Sean Connery starring in a Roger Moore Bond film. It's a comedy, and yes, that scene where he has no shirt on and he he looks like your dad after a tray of lasagna <laughs> and he just walks <laughs> hello darling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, his toupee God. is like glued half oh, it's an bad. inch above his Jill eyes. St. John on a, on a, on a, who's great, but on a yeah. bed. I, I mean, yeah, Charles Gray is like, Charles you were Gray? another guy in the, in, yeah. by the way, he was in the movie before that. That's as somebody right. else. It's all like, bizarre. Yeah. But Jimmy people Dean. Don't the, Jimmy Dean is, get, get him, Thumper. Oh, he's Hughes. yours, Bambi. Oh, my God. But, but the at thing the time, is, yes, go ahead. At the time, yeah, also, well, you know, the, the last Bond movie was like two or three years ago, which I hated. Oh, which, um, which is the one with no the time Christoph to die. Waltz? No time to die. Yeah, which I hate it. Okay. And easy. spoiler, have you seen it? Uh, yes. Is okay. that the one the where he dies? Yeah. Spoiler yeah, alert. He yeah. dies. He dies. Thank yeah. you for missing the point yeah. of this no entire character. <laughs> yeah, <well. laughs> you know, it's like okay, money, money got, decisions. Yeah, you got it completely wrong. Well done. Yeah, but. <laughs> And they don't even know what they're going to do next. They're like, no, it's going to be a while. We don't know yet. And that was already three years ago. Yeah, I guess so. They used to make them every fucking year. I suppose, Diamonds yeah. Are Forever yeah. came out in 1970. Honor Majesty's Secret Service came out in 1969. You Only Live Twice came out at the end of 67. Yeah. Like, these things just bam. And that's three different actors. But then it was, it was bam, the, the bam, Roger Moore bam. years was like, what? Uh, Octopussy, Moonraker. Uh, uh, Live and Let uh, Die, Man, Man with the Golden Gun. Right. Man with the Golden Gun. Spy Who Loved Me, Moonraker, For Your Eyes Only. That's a lot. Octopussy, oh, look at you. Go, kill. baby. Go. You go, girl. Yeah, Sorry. by the time, but by the time it's at the end, by the time 
a view to a kill comes by, they put him with Patrick McNee as his assistant oh, because yeah. Patrick McNee was the only guy older than Roger Moore. That they could That's right. That's very funny. That's very <laughs> funny. Made him look halfway decent. And meanwhile, the whole conceit, the whole 007 conceit, which was used very effectively on the original Avengers TV show with sure. Diana Rigg and Patrick McNee. And- yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. The, uh, watch how I turn this in. Let's go. Let's go. So... After uh, after uh, Roger Moore died, Timothy Dalton was Bond for two yes. movies. My old neighbor. Um, I met him. A nice guy. Really lovely not, guy. By the way, yeah, he was my neighbor. I, yeah. I talked to him all the time. Yeah. Uh, incredibly nice and incredibly funny. Funny, like, good. Yeah. But not as Bond. Like, yeah. as Bond, he was just kind of boring. I just don't think that dead. was his fault, though, right? I no, mean, no, no. I, I think they tried to darken it at the time. But, tr- but he also played it like for he played it like the books and like you're not right. making a book you're making a movie right right right. right. um and i mean but when you see what daniel craig did like it, what he tried kind of caught up he yeah. was ahead of his time he was yeah. ahead of his time yeah but i'm now listening to a um a book on tape that he read uh, yeah. a really great book called christine falls a, mm-hmm. a irish murder mystery and it's so it's like i it's hard when you hear a book an audio book read by somebody really skilled it's because there are some books that it's a great book but i can't hear the i the reader is so terrible i'm yeah. not gonna do it you've read one of the longest books in uh <laughs> what, in a, history. Oh, what a transition i didn't know what not yeah. know where you were going you read it i read audio it. books that's like what 700 pages it's 1200 pages 1200 pages yeah so please. you did 700 a day like how many, i did 700 how pages how long a day. does that take and it must you must just collapse at the end of those days. Uh, well, I did it a long time ago, so I can plausibly say I was younger then. And so sure. while I still do them now, they usually take about three days, three and a half, four maximum. There's palpable and observable Vocal. wear and tear. Yeah. But that took two weeks of, I want to say, six hour days, five, six hour days. And uh, I haven't listened to it. I mean, in, in years and years, but I went deep. I, I did all these voices and went yeah. crazy. No, it's a real performance. Well, I, I still am getting lots of good um, reviews about it. I'm very proud of it. Uh, yeah. I don't know what compelled it's a great, me to it's, do it's, so well. It's, I don't know. It's great. Uh, no, it's great. And you did other, you've done a lot done a of whole King. Bunch, yeah, a whole bunch. Uh, I mean, not a lot of King. I mean, but that was the, I mean, once you've done that, then technically yeah. you have done a lot of King, but. But that's a big book. Yeah. But since then, I've done a bunch of a great writer by the name of Harlan Coben. I've done some, um, uh, oh, God. I mean, a whole bunch of books. I love doing them because, hey, yeah. I get paid to read. Sure. Uh, so but you, it's also fun. But, but now we're in the, the realm of Stephen King. Yes. Um, how did you score The Shining? Yeah, miniseries uh, directed by our mutual friend Mick Garris. Mick Garris. Speaking of my neighbors, Timothy right. Dalton, no longer my neighbor. Right. Mick Garris, now my neighbor. It's a good, another good transition. Yes, yeah. he's the sweetest guy. You don't suspect that in that under that flowing white hair, <laughs> that Johnny Winter like man, Johnny Winter, but with some, <laughs> but who's gotten some with sun, some pigment, with some pigment. <laughs> I was once in a um, I was once in a waiting room at a uh, at an uh, a detoxing clinic. Uh, it's a long story. Uh, <laughs> it's in, certainly... a, in a smoking room with Johnny Winter smoking away and uh, wow. looking every bit and funny and nice. And he he was the, he was whiter than the cigarettes he smoked. Sure, I can't imagine. Yeah, he was he was albino. Roy Orbison was not. I think he just dyed his hair to look cool. Yeah, Roy um, Emerson, I don't think was albino. I think he was no, Albanian. He was Albanian, but he did dye his hair and he wore sunglasses on stage because they made him look cool. All right, transition your way out of that back to what we're talking about. Go ahead, I did. But he you. could still see through his sunglasses even on stage at night. And I remember seeing you in the Shining miniseries <laughs> wondering, how did he get there? You're, and, you're too good for this, <laughs> for this genre. Uh, <laughs> um, but that must have been... that. That must have been daunting, I think, on everybody's part, 
because well, the film, the first film is iconic. You're doing something right. completely different. Right. Well, okay. Um, but, but to be perfectly honest, uh, you know, one of my things, one of the things that I look on as one of my personal failings was that I didn't take myself seriously enough to be daunted, to give a shit. And maybe I should have, maybe I would have done things differently in, in a creative way. That said, um, apparently, uh, to hear uh, Mick tell the story, they already had somebody in the role, Jack Torrance, an English actor, in fact, who's, he still hasn't told me who it is. Timothy Dalton. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, Benny Hill. Ben, yeah. <laughs> and, um, he's going to go through the maze, but really fast, <laughs> really fast. And to, uh, Yakety Sacks. <laughs> um, by the way, if you yes. put Yakety Sacks under The Shining, it's a very entertaining movie. <laughs> And if you play Yakety Sax backwards, it's the same fucking song. It's the same. There's no change, no discernible change. <laughs> um, so uh, they apparently, and this actor fell out for whatever reason. And so they were kind of under the gun. And this was uh -huh. obviously the production that, that Stephen King was going to script himself. Yes. Because while and it did wasn't. Did not? Or, or did Mick script that? No, as Stephen King wrote the script. I think Mick probably consulted with a little you know, but, mm -hmm. but Stephen King had already done a couple of films, you know. Yep. By that time. Um, maximum and, Overdrive. Maximum Overdrive. And um, Which he shot at on the same sound stages, like next door to each other, at the same time, Blue Velvet. Both being shot for Dino De Laurentiis in really? North Carolina at his film facility at the same time. And yet there are no kind of cool offset photos of both casts mingling, no, you know, which no. I love uh, to they're, this day. I'm like, I, they're I, very I, different films, <laughs> very different films. That's right. Um, and Dennis Hopper was way scarier than, than anything in maximum mode. <laughs> yes. Then the, then that truck with the green goblin mask. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, I, I don't know, I guess the audition came and I, and it was, uh, just a reading and a meeting and, uh, I didn't, have any nerves particularly i mean by that time i was i had already been doing wings and so i had a degree yeah. of confidence and uh and i was presenting as a jaunty devil may care guy and that right. was sort of what i thought i was anyway and i went in and met stephen king and met mick for the first time and there was rebecca de mornay and i knew who she was and i just proceeded to read and give it whatever it was i yeah. gave and uh and very shortly, maybe the same day or the day after, they were like, okay, you got it. And I thought, great. But I wasn't daunted, even having uh -huh. been a fan of the Kubrick film. Um, obviously, it was and did much... They say, did they say when you come in, well, this is what we're trying to do here? As yes. opposed to it, yeah. Yeah, essentially. Uh, I, I probably did look at the, the script, I think, which was... Because actually, from... Nicholson's performance is the thing about that movie that King doesn't like. Yes. They, well, one of the things. I mean, he says, yeah. you know, very famously that... Uh, uh, you know, the Overlook Hotel in Kubrick's film was, uh, <laughs> was, uh, uh was co cold. And the one in the original story is hot, you know, because the, 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 the Overlook explodes into flames yeah. in my, and so, and that's the heart of, uh, we're trying to get the heat back or something like that. And, um, but they basically said, this is going to be way more faithful to the King book and, uh, go into a lot more detail. He, there's more of a, uh, a character arc and a trajectory for all the characters. And um, so I got it. And we did it. And we did it over a long period of time. We were actually able to experience actual winters in uh, Estes Park, Colorado. Yeah, as well I've as been in that hotel. Springs. I stayed at that hotel. Yeah, it's a great hotel. And now it's like a big thing. I mean, I followed them on Instagram. Oh, yeah. no, It's, it's so super hotel. hip. I mean, when yeah. I, back then it was, um, it was still a little musty. I mean, it had sure. a little, uh, but but it wasn't a, a tourist attraction particularly. Yeah, no, Goldthwait and I did a show there. Oh, how fantastic! Um, yeah, no, I, I, and then and then you, but then you do, you get in with King and you get in with Garris, and that's a whole other chapter of uh, of your career. Yeah, you yeah. ended up. Tell the story before we go. Uh, we were, I was again from the last episode. We were talking about Jennifer. Oh yeah, that's right. This the the creepy story. One uh, of the most disturbing creepy stories. A creepy, obviously, you know, it's a basically a, a horror comic from although it was a magazine. Yeah, from Warren Publications. Guys walking through the woods and sees a guy about to kill this woman with an axe. With an axe, 
And then he warns the guy off. The guy doesn't respond. He shoots the guy dead. Yeah. And the woman looks up and she's horribly disfigured. She and looked like the, one of the Morlocks in the time yeah. machine. Right. So he feels pity for her. He takes her in uh, and brings her home to his family. And she's not cuddly and warm. It's not Harry and the Hendersons. She's the monster. <laughs> but she's built like a brick shithouse. Yeah, with an ugly face and an amazing body. Unbelievable body that Bernie Wrightson renders, uh, you know, clad in a kind of a yeah. clingy, nighty stuff. Like it was so erotic. Yep. But a, a, a fantastic piece of horror. Yeah. You know, really, yeah. really And brilliant. he ends up leaving his family. Yeah. And going on the road with this woman. Where she turns him into her sex slave. Yeah, pretty much. Which is not a turn I was expecting at 10. <laughs> <laughs> well, but uh, you're, you're forgetting uh, that um, one of the reasons why he had to leave with her was because she had eaten the cat. Cat. Yeah, she that, had, that. Uh, she was experiencing, uh, they were experiencing this kind of nascent cannibalism that apparently was her. Mm -hmm. You know, a yeah. weakness of hers. Yeah. So you're talking about, and that later, I don't know if this was directly, you would know this. Was this inspired by Jennifer? But Matabitu, which is the Japanese movie. Oh, gosh, I don't is know. It's very similar to Jennifer. If I've you've never, never seen, seen it, it I'll, I'll send you a link to it. All right, please similar. do. But so you're on the set of, I guess you're on the set of The Shining? No, I was on the set of uh, the second King miniseries I did, which is arguably not as uh, good, although a lot of it is, called Desperation. Right. And um, and that was part of a two book series, was it not? Oh, God, that's right. That's right. Well, I can't think of the name of this. Yeah. Like uh, that's one with like that tack, tack, a la. That's that right. Yeah. That was Ron yeah. Perlman. Right. Uh, we had great. And King reads the book with he, that weird flat tack, did, tack, tack, a la. tack, tack, a la. <laughs> it's almost, it's almost like uh, from Team America, you know. Uh, tack, a la. Phone yeah. sex with Stephen King. Yeah, I'm gonna get you in the bed. It's gonna be really <laughs> warm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and and uh, and so I guess uh, as we like to say, in between setups. Sure. Uh, as one um, does. As one does. Uh, Mick was, I guess, talking about him about doing the next project, which was um, uh, getting uh, all these amazing directors. And giving them each an episode um, uh, to film. Right, master, Masters, Masters of Horror. Horror. And to film without interference. Uh, they were short stories, an anthology series. And, um, and they had everybody. And so I, I just threw this in. I said, man, you know, it'd be a good story. Remember Jennifer Creepy? Uh, the, uh, Bruce Jones was the writer. And Bernie Wright's in my hero. My God. And he was. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and he said, well, why don't you write it? I said, uh, really? Okay. And I wrote a version of it, which uh -huh. had to be padded because the sure. actual story is I mean, pretty short. Yeah. It's like a page yeah. of dialogue. In it. Yeah. And, um, and so we did it and, and that we expanded it and then it was going to be done. I was thrilled and, and more, and then they dropped the bomb, uh, which was a love bomb that Dario Argento <laughs> was going to be the director. Wow. That and is amazing. It was amazing. So we were thrilled and we made it and Dario was a trip and uh, we had an amazing actress who played Jennifer. Who, uh, played, who did play Jennifer? Oh God. She's really stupendous. And um, I hate this. It's just been years. It wasn't Asia. No, 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 it was not. Uh, no, an amazing, beautiful Canadian actress who, Worked this makeup, uh, which was very different from the Bernie Wrightson yeah. uh, makeup. Um, yeah. And that it, it had a degree of, look, I mean, it was terrifying, but it had a degree of, I'm going to say stiffness. It, did, it lacked the kind of animation that the original concept had. But right. she was able to, uh, she was absolutely able to, you know, work with it. Make it, it come know. to life. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I have experience acting under prosthetics. Carrie Ann Fleming is her name. Carrie, Carrie Fleming. Ann Fleming. I have heard that name before. Uh, she's stupendous, you know, and yeah. just, and, and so game and a wonderful actress. Uh, and, uh, and we did it. And the only weird thing was that Dario, first of all, speaks and communicates like a cart, like somebody doing a cartoon yeah, a Italian accent. Yeah. 
And this was such a psychotic, brutal thing. And he wanted to pad it out with even more brutal erotica. There was an anal rape scene in it that uh, it had not occurred to me. Uh, there was a scene that was shot where Jennifer is devouring a severed penis of a young boy. And they had the penis prop with the uh, appropriate kind of mouth gouges in it. Oddly not used in the final. Yeah, I mean, really oh, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. And they would say to me, like, eh, you go, eh, eh, choker, choker, but the fuck, the fuck, and the blood, the blood, the go, the do, the bit. <laughs> and, and it was like, and, and the crew would look at each other like, okay, and nobody knew what the fuck was happening. But we did it. And it's, I guess it's effective. I think it's pretty good. Yeah, I told you the story about uh, that I heard from somebody. I figured, well, I, I'm not going to tell you who. To, I'm not going to say here who told me the story. Oh, okay. But you know who told me the story. Okay. They're doing a movie. Dario's directing Asia, his daughter, and she's in just the dialogue scene with her boss. They're yeah. like at a law firm, and he goes to the actor. In this scene, I want you to act like Asia. You're just a raper, and now you're talking. He's like, well, that's that's not what happened. I know, but that's the power. You're just a raper. It's twisted. Your your daughter? <laughs> yeah, as a good. <laughs> I'm I'm out of character suddenly. Yeah, I, I, exactly. I don't know I don't what to do. Be, I don't want to be in this anymore. I don't want to be <laughs> anymore. Yeah, it's great. It was great. All sorts. Of, it was fun. Yeah, that was uh, all that stuff is week. So, what are you? Uh, what are you? Uh, what are you up to now? Oh, what am I up to now? Well, aside from the I strike, you're on strike, you're on strike, you know, obviously. I'm. Uh, I've been appearing for the la- appearing. I've been working for the last three seasons on a show called Chicago Med, which is in the right. Dick Wolf universe, mm-hmm. which shoots in Chicago. Which right. I, I love. For I love those Chicago. of you who follow you on Instagram, oh uh, yes, it's called Actually the- Stephen Weber at mm-hmm. Actually Stephen Weber, and it's a very lefty. Uh, I have to stop. I have to stop being on Instagram altogether. It's really a drug. It's messing me up. It's not that, as bad it, as some of the others. It's not as bad as some of the others. I'm still enjoyable. I still mm-hmm. are, are, am witty. Sure. Uh, but uh, uh, so I'm, I'm doing that. You know, I'm a, I'm a working actor. I've done incredibly well, far beyond my own expectations. And uh, um, I'm in a good bandwidth now. Like I, uh-huh. I, after, after years of kind of being unmoored in many ways, I've, I've found a, I found a way to, to live a safe, uninteresting, but happy existence. Oh, that's what, that's the goal. That's, that's, that's the goal. Yeah, I don't want that. Up here is too high and crazy. Down here is sure. too low. I'm right in the kind of, hey, uh-huh. I, I, oh, it's 830. I'm going to start going to bed. Start my uh-huh. ritual, my bed ritual. Now so, are you, uh, is there, is there a, uh, is there a Mrs. Weber in the world right now? Uh, there is. Again, it's a, it's an interesting story, but I realize that it's not for your, uh, listeners, no, just, this just is curious. my life. Just curious. It's my life, and why I'll do tell, what I want. Why don't you just tell her us her name and like her phone number? We can call her if we have questions. His name was. I understand that. Com- I understand that completely. I just like you know. It's I like to. I like to just ha- like I was telling this to somebody last night. Um, and this goes back a long way, but like I thought I was going to be hugely famous. Yeah, you, know, you are like, famous, like, like, but let me like ninety one. Like I thought I was going to be like a movie star. Right, right, right. Because people told me I was going to be a movie. Of star. Of course, people who, if I had become a movie star, would have made a lot of money off me. That's why they were telling me that. And then I met somebody who was every bit as unfamous as I was at mm-hmm. the time. I meet this person who's. We're right in the same bandwidth, right? In terms of like fame. Right. We're both nobodies. Right. A young, fresh faced Ben Stiller. Ah, yes. And and I thought I was gonna be famous. And then I talked to Ben for a half an hour. And I went, Oh, I'm fucked. What? Like, hey, he, I cannot compete with this guy. But you can. Just, but he was no I, I don't say this in a negative way at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. and I you know, I he was just so focused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. his drive was so pure. Well, and he yeah. knew exactly what he wanted to do. These are not insults. I, I'm. It's very admirable. And I was like, I don't know. I, I like. I'm funny, but I like horror movies. I don't know. But here's here's. But that, <laughs> interestingly enough, at least for me, um, focus and drive 
have become the focus and drive of sure. my life. Uh -huh. And I have two sons who are incredibly gifted musicians and uh, are supremely uh, talented and big hearted and really good. Like I don't have to yeah. bullshit. Oh, it's my son's music. I'm in awe of their ability yeah. to. Uh, but the thing that seems to need more development is focus and drive. And, and I don't mm -hmm. know if that's a function of how they were brought up or the culture that they're in, but the people who we all admire have focus and drive and they right. eschew some pleasure for that, 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 that kind yeah. of dry focus. And, and like, I, I just have to do this. It makes all the difference, man. It's I, very hard to say no to yourself. I began to be more, I, look, I, I've always worked, which, uh, which is fantastic. I've had ups and downs and everything, but for the most yeah. part, it's, I've been working and I began to have a different quality of work once I developed a, uh, a sense of exactly where I wanted to go and had my hand figuratively on the figurative tiller right. of my ship. You know, whereas sure, before yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, you it was like, I, I guess I'm, I'm talented, uh, arguably, and you know, people and you're entertaining and all that stuff. But I was floating around on little yep. updrafts and that's great until it's not. Yeah. Until you're yeah. surpassed or people moving past you who kind of have the, have the drive yeah. and the focus. So. Yeah. And there's, and there's a point where you're, you know, that you reach where you're not new anymore. You've, you know, people know who you are, but you, right. yeah, we can go to that. But, and there, and the people that were looking up at you are now arrived. Right. And your replacements have arrived. Dana, and, uh, that can be it's tough. all over. Yeah. It can we come full circle. That's and right. And then you have to like get down with like, no, I'm I'm just going to do what I can do, right? Uh, that I enjoy doing, and, and there's an uh, audience for that, and there's hundred percent, and there's a uh, uh, there, there's great appreciation for it, and this is proof of it. Well, I guess so. You know, yeah. seriously, and and uh, you know, you evolve your your sensibilities evolve, and and uh, you have to you have to grow with things, or else if you don't if you don't let go of the past, you'll be dragged. Steven Weber, thank you very much. This was terrific. I hope so. I, I want to please you. <laughs> well, if more, if more people were like that, the world would be a better place. Um, but I will see you very soon. Yes. I, thank you for having me on the air. Right. And uh, is this air? Thank you for having me yeah. on your show. My pleasure. I'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. Signing off. Signing off. Other podcasts reach for the sky Dana Goldbaum We barely try This has been the Dana Gould Hour Brought to you by the internet Music by Andy Paley With Jake Posner behind the board Produced by Jeff Fox. Graphic design and web production by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing and post-production by Jalinda Palmer and Joe Napolitano. Hey, if you like the show, why don't you drop us a line at show at danagould.com. Tom Kenny speaking. I'm a DJ, I'm a DJ, I'm a person, I'm a person, I'm a singer, I'm a singer, I love to sing, and DJ, boom! Peace out. Peace out. You want me? Peace out. <laughs> Boom.